This week on our SBNB Update, we've gathered our resources and it's time for a deep dive into the lore of the Infernal Source. Of course, it's also Mental Health Awareness Week and we consider what parts of OSRS should come to RS3. This is RSBNB Update, episode 778, recorded Thursday, May 21st, 2020, The Infernal Source of Lore. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us for another episode of RSBNB Update, episode 778 this week. And, you know, this week is Mental Health Awareness Week in game, and it, we also got some patch notes. But, as we talked about when archaeology first came out, at the tail end of March, almost two months ago, we had a great, grand plan of how we were going to cover the skills launch and you know this week is one week where we actually are about to dive in even deeper to that skill you thought we were covering everything as it was already but we can actually take it to one level deeper and that's when we start discussing lore and you know this one is going to be very interesting it's the infernal source joining us to spearhead this effort and you produce such a wonderful segment on this so it's uh, Diana, who has been our resident lore expert now for quite some time. So welcome back to the show. Thank you very much, Shane. And also Sirion is here, and he's here to ask the hard questions. I'm also here to point out that you made a pun in the first five minutes of an episode. It wasn't intended. I have no idea what pun I made. You were going deeper into the Infernal Source. Oh, no. We're uncovering another layer of the lore. That How was totally. Can see that? In. My, oh my, oh. That was totally unintended. But is it too late to go out? Save me. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's doing that. Tadis, you're also here as you are each and every week. Thanks, Shane. Yeah, I'm going to uh, enjoy sit back and enjoy this episode. I um, don't always get to take the lore in uh, the first time around, so best way to do it is listen to smart people talk about it. That's so right. That's what I'm going to do right. today. He is Tana 79 in game. I am Shane12088. <laughs> and uh, let's begin. Mental Health Awareness Week. Um, you guys participating in this event? Uh, nope. give, give Don't really have a choice, in. right? <laughs> no, I mean, in terms of participating, you're going to get the tokens. And you could put them towards the event. Or you could convert them to mystery boxes. That's what I meant. Uh, my dislike of currency events is quite well known now, so I've been throwing the tokens away and digging bigger holes. All right. Wow, that's that's yeah. that's quite aggressive. I, it's not I... archaeology related at the moment. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I um, yeah, I don't like currency events either. Usually, um, I think they're yeah they're a bit lazy. Um, that being said, you know, for once. The armor looks okay for once, so, you know, I might put the uh, tokens towards the event. We'll see if I get enough to get the outfit. I always find it silly that if you don't get enough tokens, you get, like, half the outfit, which you're never going to use. Yeah. Or you just get the pants. Yeah. That's it. <laughs> or it's the most important part. <laughs> and failing that, you buy it back from the uh, event shop for rune coins and you know since this is a charity event it runs for the one week 18th to the 24th by the time you guys are listening to this we'll be well into the last third of this um all proceeds from this event go to charities are going to be split between cpsl mind rise above the disorder and the princess trust and you with this you can head to just north of the lumbridge crater talk to the representatives from all these charities, and each time you talk to them every day, each representative will have a small lamp for you if you answer one of their questions right. And, you know, I, I think we just have to, once again, and, you know, we did this at the RuneFest episode, and we've done this numerous times since then with the Drop 2, um, commend Jagex and commend 
the community for the charitable in- initiatives that have been done. And, you know, I think if you compared this amongst other game development companies out there, you would find that Jagex and the RuneScape community as a whole, as one big entity, are perhaps one of the most generous out there. So this is a very good event to take part in. And, you know, if this cosmetic armor appeals to you, this is uh, all the perfect time to buy some of those tokens if you don't complete it by playing uh, the event in-game, if you like the armor. Personally, I'm not too much a fan of the orange or red. I, I think it's like a reddish orange, we could say, right? I've uh, I've been told it matches quite well with the primal armor from uh, Dungeoneering. Okay, yeah. It, it's like a reddish orange, and, you know, I, I think if orange is your thing, then this is going to be uh, pretty good to... Mm, who wears an orange cape all the time? You do. Mm. Oh. So this might be for you. Um, in any case, you can also purchase items from the past mental health awareness events like the uh, Brain Plushie, Defender of the Mind Wings, and all the various pets and whatnot from previous years as well, and even purchases from those go towards those charities. So it is indeed a worthy cause, and it is in-game until Monday. And I don't think there's much else to say about that, so we can move on to patch notes right now. Um, just hand just, your just, tokens. Just, 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 just one thing, just one thing, because I'm going to make it real for a second and say that, you know, these... I, I, I know people who have mental health problems, and these, uh, these charities do really do good things. Um, and the second thing I want to say is um, everything is weird right now out there, so it's okay to not be okay. And if you feel like you need to talk to someone, go talk to someone. I think you've said the entire purpose of this event and what it's designed to bring awareness to, and we'll just echo that and hopefully through that as well you know this podcast is a good outlet for people to and you know if we can just raise a little bit more awareness about this event from what's already been been raised to that makes me feel really good too Mm -hmm. all right so patch notes this week you know the archaeology patch notes just keep coming and coming and we're you know a month and a half in with this so this is one starting off that people have wanted for a long time If you're making a crystal matic or a matic of space and time, you can now create those through Lady Ithil, and your augments and perks will carry through. And if you're creating the matic of space and time, you'll be asked which of the two, from either the Imkando or the crystal, you want to carry through its augments and perks. Which, when you think of how much money some people can spend on perks... This makes a lot of sense, and it's absolutely a crucial update. I mean, this is one of those in- – it's a super interesting um, design thing, right? Um, basically, the old way, it was never fu- – it, it never made sense to augment both – or e- either of them, actually, right? You can't – you couldn't – uh, take over either of the augments. It never made sense to augment them because you get away of the um, you get rid of them when you upgrade, which basically means that the content is dead, like quite literally, because it just doesn't make sense to do so. So this is, in a way, it's really generous what they do. But on the other hand, if they don't do this, nobody would use that piece of content. People would sort of take away that advantage of having an augmented gear with perks from them. Yeah. Looking forward to like, oh, because I will upgrade it to the next thing yeah. at that level. Yeah. So it, it it just makes a lot of sense. And arguably it was a design mistake to not have this from the get-go. So I'm really glad they added that. Indeed. Uh, missing images in the archaeology journal have been added for Armadillion, Zamorakian, and Ceridomist collections and they added this i think the second or third week of archaeology for all the other artifacts but these ones were still missing so that's nice when you open it you can see uh very high quality art pieces of what the artifacts look like i would totally be on board with more of this 
yeah. in the game. It's, it's very graphical, right? Mm-hmm. Which, which is good. The augmented Inquisitor staff can now be keepsaked. Valicia and Isora have realized that they've misplaced items from Zamorakian 3 into Zamorakian 4 and vice versa. This has been corrected so that the Virius Trophy and the Chaos Elemental Trophy have been moved to Zamorakian 4, while the Possession Metal Sculpture and the Trishula and Sutsaroth Piercing have been moved to Zamorakian 3. And this is actually... I have to correct my spreadsheet now, aren't I? Yeah, this is actually really important um, because, you know, as you're progressing along through this... There's a big difference in terms of levels of Zamorakian 3 and Zamorakian 4. And if you want to use this collection as a way of kind of ticking off the marks towards moving towards your next qualification, that'd be kind of unfortunate. Quick travel options have been added to the entrances of the Infernal Source and Everlight dig sites just to allow you to uh, get around a little bit faster than you were before. I haven't, I haven't encountered these. Where, where did it take you um, Somebody checked? Yeah, so I haven't checked the Everlight one, but I have been through the Infernal Source one. Previously, there were only three at the Infernal yep. Source. There was the bar, and then the place where you do the ritual, and then the top of the actual source itself. The two that the they added... The bottom as well, right? No, no. They added that one. wasn't there before. No, they added one for the bottom and one for the middle of the source. Those are the two they added. I've seen the bottom one, but not the middle one. Okay. Before. Well, I, I know they definitely added one to the middle of the source. Are you right? There was the one from the bottom. I don't know. I haven't been to that one. Uh, how? But how? Oh, okay. How would that work? Is it like maybe on the agility you, shortcut? I'm going to check. All right, I'll, you I do that and get back to us. Um, yeah. Activating all eight Kredet Shadow Anchors will now grant players a fast travel option to the Praetorium from the Kredet entrance. Very nice. And the orientation of the Stormguard Citadel skybox has been flipped to better reflect the world map. Thank Yes, did that was annoying comment, me so did, much. Didn't you comment on that, Shane? I yeah, was, I did. I thought it was correct. Yeah, I, I told, thought it was correct. Right? I told no, you it was, it was reversed. It was reversed. Uh, North I, and I South can't. had been flipped round, and it would really annoyed me when I noticed it. Oh, I see. So that's good, that's fixed. <laughs> and, and the one everybody's been waiting for, the Calgarian demon familiar pet has been shrunk to be less obtrusive. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> Gee. Wow, okay, it's well, bit, at least we win boy, some, yeah. we lose some here this week. I'll, I'll take it. That doesn't quite get me all my money back that I had to buy a second Matic two weeks ago. Should have waited, but, but I'll take it. I'll take it. Smaller Calgarian demons. It's only about, uh, like, its head comes up to the head point on your player, and then its wings just go up a bit more above that. So it's still bigger than the player, but it's not nearly as bad as it was. So let's just shrink everything by a certain percent. It's what they did with the clan avatars. Best update ever. Yeah. Which they used to be huge. Yeah. I I think they should also also shrink the... um, Flappy Shadow Drakes. Yeah. Yeah. That needs it. Yeah. So to report back on Everlight, either I haven't unlocked the teleport points yet, or I'm doing it wrong, but uh, the scaffold doesn't um, give me any options. Hmm. So it might be once you get in Everlight, but, you know, I'm, I'm but too then, noob But to then get you're there. relatively free to just run around in there, so... Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave that one. In other changes this week, other patch notes, combat XP is now awarded when the enemy's HP reaches zero rather than at the end of their death animation. Is this a big deal? No, <laughs> I don't. I'm trying to sit here thinking. Uh, I don't know. I wouldn't think so. But... Probably affected some people. But no yeah, idea how. I'm trying to think how, and I have no idea. Uh, This next one affects people, and I think these are some logical changes made. The buff bar will now prioritize its buffs differently and perhaps more efficiently. The new order is as follows. Boss effects, defensive abilities, offensive abilities, status effects, boosts like life or prayer over heals, overhead prayers, utility prayers, invention perks, item effects, skilling bonuses, pet effects, and auras. 
at the very end on here. And effects that are due to expire will no longer shuffle to the front of the bar, but will continue to flash until after they've expired or are refreshed. Um, I, I think these are some oh, good because it used to, to be it used to be ordered on uh, just on expiration. Yeah, is that it? Okay, yeah, something like that. Oh, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and you know you want to have the most important ones first because with buff bars getting longer and longer. I think we're going to oh, reach gosh, a point yeah. where you're not going to be able to see that. And, you know, speaking of that, in the last week and a half, buff bars is something that annoys me greatly on the mobile interface, but that's a topic for another day. Oh, yeah, they're just dangling somewhere randomly right, in the right. middle of the screen on the top. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I found mine at the top. Yeah, at the top, finally. It took a while, though. I didn't notice it until this week. I'm like, oh, there it is. Yeah. Finally. Um, a walk marker toggle has been added to the desktop settings. This will enable the walk marker that appears on the RS mobile client. Uh, yes or no? I've heard polarizing opinions on this up from both I haven't sides. turned it off. I haven't Neither. turned it off. I c- it's obviously a, you know, the consistency between desktop and mobile. Um, I think I will end up turning it off. Mm-hmm. I think when I, next time I do a quest, I'll turn it off. Um, but in normal gameplay, it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Been helpful to me. To me. Yeah, I really enjoyed it at first. I thought, oh, I don't know if I'll like it, but it's been incredibly helpful. It's made a good difference for you. Oh yeah, that's good. Yeah. I think I think it there. might be good also for things like position. Like if you need to make sure you stand on a specific tile, right? And like a boss fight could be really helpful. Right. In general, I just find it yeah. Because normally when you are running somewhere, you don't actually know where your character is running. And I've had in the past, I'm like, oh, I'm running in the right direction. I look away for five seconds and I've gone halfway around the no maze, for example, to a completely <laughs> different path because I misclicked. It's this- also helpful in um, seeing where exactly you issued that command because, you know, you said mm-hmm. you're using it in terms of how you're going to walk, but... You know, there's always been a question, this was very true back in the olden days of RS, is that you don't know how quickly the game is responding or if it actually heard your click. Whereas with Mm. this, we're assuming it's actually going to respond to it. Um, Whereas on the other hand, you know, I've I've heard from people like Earth who said that, you know, he absolutely doesn't like it because it's just more clutter on the screen. Um, And, you know, that's just... It's Go just ahead. a problem with the game in general, though. Yeah, it is. It really is. And it says it's supposed to be turned off by default. <laughs> what? Mine was on. I never had to turn it yeah, off. That's I never the patch notes. Yeah. yeah. Mine was on automatically. Yeah, it was on automatically. But in the news post, it said, and it doesn't say it in the patch notes, but it said it in the news post that, um, oh, oh, we misread. This option will be enabled by default. Oh, <laughs> okay. No problem. Then. Either we misread or they changed it. Yeah, one of the two. Cause, I would not put that be because you and I were both fairly convinced that yeah. it said that it would be off by default. Yeah, right. Yeah. Also, another thing that's good about this is um, many more people play on desktop than on mobile. So if this is something they want to like, it might not be their primary reason for doing it, but this way you get a lot of more people testing it and especially something like i showed you some um animations right from yeah. warforge yeah. where you know the the geometry is weird somehow and i can't figure out how to orient the the markers that kind of stuff you only really find <laughs> by just having lots of people try it out and that's what you get on desktop and maybe not on mobile so added benefit even if that's not the primary reason they do it yeah and a fun little thing is if it actually shows you now if you click on a tile that's inaccessible it shows where your player's path marker moves to because if you click somewhere that's on a hill you can't get to it'll move to the bottom of the hill i don't know if you noticed that as well uh, no this has been a like i said this with the combined with the outlining that's been a great update um accessibility wise it's made it a lot easier uh both playing on mobile and did you and notice the colors desktop. for the walk marker are colorblind neutral yeah well i noticed them so that was good <laughs> on a, any other day i might not have um 
Yeah. But, you know, and now you have little symbols like if you're clicking on a wisp, like, because you couldn't tell for sure where you were clicking right. before. Like, there was no, like. And you don't need custom cursors now for that. No. So this is, um, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a real big fan, real yeah. big fan of this. Good. Good to hear. That's, that's really good to hear. Um, the Easter event hub and the Easter eggs have been re- removed. <laughs> At last. <laughs> it was like a month late. <laughs> yeah, this is because someone complained to Mod Mike last week that they were still in game. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Those things probably just slipped through the cracks, but with the, everyone moving to working from home and lots of other stuff happening, it probably just, it was so minor. Yeah. That it just, just got missed. Uh, players will no longer be able to uh, remove items with combat stats from their tool belts while on Entrena. And that's the last for the patch ooh, notes. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> oh, right? the pickaxe. That would have made a nice big difference to the drama tree fight. Oh. Oh, that's very nice. <laughs> ah, amazing. All righty. Well, it's time to talk about the infernal source now. Um, and, you know, this is. I, Things I think, are going to get hot. Yeah, they are. Uh,. And, you know, with this, I think that this is one of the dig sites that, I don't know, I really didn't have a strong affinity for, thinking about it. At the beginning or in general? Just just in general. Um, okay. No. When you say affinity, either. can you elaborate on that? Well, I mean, I think it's because it didn't, it did it felt like, okay, there's a couple of collections here and there we can use and we're going to get shuffled around a bit. I feel like it's the dig site I've spent the least amount of time at. And For me, just it's the because dig of site that, I tried, to, I tried to spend the least time at. <laughs> See, I really like it. Okay. That's the, kind of the reason I chose it first, because it's the lowest level one to well, complete yeah, in inverted and, and commas. I, I, I haven't obviously got sense, to the end of it. Right? But, um, um, the entire point of it to me is to introduce ancient summoning. Yes. That and, is the entire point of this site. And perhaps that's why it's also very low level too. Um, Cause you can complete it at what? 68, I think. It's 68, like the mysteries. Yeah. yeah. Obviously there's some research and whatnot that continues well beyond that, but the mysteries are all completable at 68. All right. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to run through a bit of how the uh, actual dig site is structured. Then we're going to go through the mysteries Talk a little bit about the research and then uh, bring up some unanswered questions with this. And I'm going to turn it over largely uh, in this part to Diana. I'll ask questions along the way. Sirion will ask questions along the way. And uh, Tannis will expand his knowledge and also ask questions along the way. Right. So let's start with Mavario, actually. Mavario, head of the dig site. Uh, We talked about him in the first lore dive we did about it. He's in um, some Fifth Age quests. He's had a complete new redesign, and I think he looks fantastic. Yeah, like, all, all his of the, at the end of the do, document. This one really does too. He's so much more characterful now. He actually looks like a you know badass old man who could probably kill you. Um, he's got all these facial piercings, and in his concept art, anyway, he's got this amazing face tattoo, um, which I don't think made it into game. Just looking at him now. No, I did make it into the game in the end, which is a bit of a disappointment. But yeah, I think that looks fantastic. Nice. So isn't isn't Movario like the big baddie of like, um, oh, what what's the name of the quest? The one where you go into the chaos tunnels. While Gothic sleeps. And then while Gothic, Gothic sleeps, like I think oh, it's like yeah. two quests. Yeah, that was him. Like, is isn't he like the big baddie there? Like, like proper big baddie. He is a bit. The last time we saw him, I think, was at the end of Ritual of the Majorat. Yes. Right. And he's been uh, in the cave underneath the ritual site. And he was helping Everson. Lucian in while Gothic sleeps. Yeah. With that. So, right. So I find it weird that they would put him as site manager. I, it's weird that I, he's working with the World Guardian. Yeah. I, I find that a bit odd. They, they tried to explain it away, but... It, 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 it. I would almost say it works better the other way around, right? Like, you get like another of these nomad situations where uh, 
we can spoil, right? We can spoil the stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, of course. We're going to be talking about the Lars, so go for it. So, like, Soul Wars starts out being managed by Nomad, but, you know, as you progress through the quest series, at some point you get that imp that I know don't know the name of right now Zimba that Fist. takes over that place, right? I think for a new player, this would be super interesting to be in the same situation, right? Where Movario is like this site manager that you don't know much about. Then he gets involved in all these quests. And then... Yeah, that's something I wanted else... to ask but a new guess... player about, almost. Because it's the same and... with... Go for... Actually, you finish yours first. It doesn't really work with the 5th age, 6th age stuff, because I guess archaeology is a 6th age skill, if I remember correctly. Yes. So maybe it doesn't really work that way, because he's in 5th age quests, but you know that sounds like a more interesting mechanic. Right now, he's jared there. I'm like, shouldn't it be in prison somewhere? Um, I think the one prison I think is your is a different Zamorakian one. Uh, yeah, there's that guy too. Surok. Yeah, Surok, the head of the Dagon High. So, is this a question we can ask then? Is how is how exactly does Movario being in this position here in the sixth age work when you know he's obviously involved in those fifth age quests and we're seemingly not having any justification for now. Oh, he's up here now managing the Infernal Source dig site. I found it a little bit jarring that he's now presented as more of a neutral character right. when mm-hmm. he has previously been an antagonist. But mm-hmm. I don't know. Um, it would be interesting to see what a new player makes of him. And, and per- perhaps this is something we can put onto the list of the unanswered questions and ask somebody in the know about on this because you know this is definitely something that would be a bit jarring, and I think we kind of just accepted it when we were doing that initial lore deep dive, because I don't think that came up then, did it? Yeah, it's kind of a question I thought of after we'd finished recording that. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, missed that a who, bit. Let's, let's take a tiny detour. Who, who, who would be a better place, we think, to be site manager? See, because that's the alternative I, question. Who else? I, What I feel, like... This may be a bit of a criticism, but what I feel with the site manager is that there was some quick cash in of let's put a known character there for some quick, you know, popularity points and you know, recognizable stuff. Harsh. <laughs> Does it though? Like, I don't know. They put like Zanik on like the Bandel spot. I, I don't even know where Zanik was last, but wasn't she like leading all the? goblin stuff elsewhere like why she uh that was at the end of the mighty fall she then came back at the end of nomad's elegy actually during nomad's elegy um right. and was resurrected she's now a guardian of Guthix, i think but what happens if you do that quest line and go down and like in the middle this of- is something i do want to know is like the same with dr nabonik mm-hmm what happens if you start the skill and talk to him as your first dig site manager before yeah. you've done the quest relating mm-hmm. to him? That's a perspective so I, I'd like to hear about. Um, I don't know whether they've implemented some kind of branching dialogue for that. What if there's some or, kind of foreshadowing here that maybe these people who you know are managing this dig site, maybe that will be explained in some kind of quest that's following up? Because recall that when they said they were launching the skill, they built it with a year's worth of lore. I... Yeah, perhaps. Like a path yeah, they just, want to go on. Right? jumping the gun a bit. Um, a year's worth of lore? And yeah, all of it? yeah, like a year's worth of story would come from the archaeology skill in terms of quests and other things they were going to do. And mm-hmm. and they said that there is a huge hint in the archaeology skill of what happens in that next quest that nobody has found yet. Well, that's going to have me hunting around for or that for the next Or at least canonicalized <laughs> everything. Be- it, right? <laughs> Um, so, um, yeah. anyways, let's so let's go in. Let's, let's, let's go into, into the Star Lodge site. cellar. Yeah, first up, you go down the winch into the Star Lodge, uh, which has some really lovely music in it, as Syrian said. Um, let me scroll up the document again. So, yeah, this is the underground cellar of the inn that was built here. Jolly Bar Inn. Uh, it's not Jolly Bar. Oh, it's not. Jolly Bar is a little bit way. Uh, somewhere else. Uh, this is the inn that preceded it. Oh, okay. Um, it's kind of sad they didn't reuse that place. It could yeah. really have done with that. It would have been nice, but... Yeah, I suppose. Uh, see so what? We've got two different 
mit, äh, I forgot what these things are called. Excavation sites. Excavation sites, thank you. We've got two different excavation sites in here and one mystery, Eyes and Their Stars. Yep, that's the and one. And you complete Eyes and Their Stars to go further into the, uh, further into the, the site itself. Yeah, and this is one of those mysteries where I think you get one of the Eyes of Dagon, or no, there's one already up there, then you get two of them from searching the chest in the room and then you just need to excavate the third third one to make it uh four i think up you there. only get one but i think you can get one to research if you oh no you can't because you're not researching yet at yeah. that level yeah no um so yeah you but by searching all the chests you get the first hint of all oh, this is what you do next and then you just dig up the rest along with the founder's journal which is the first law drop yay um the more stories we get but what else do we find inside the cellar Oh, we find some very interesting things in the cellar. Um, some things that we had no idea what exactly they were and why they were in there. And I think this raised lots of questions in the first few days of the archaeology skill. Hang on, you're going to have to be a little bit more specific now, I'm afraid. The suggested books. Oh, <laughs> yeah. By searching the Star Lodge storage, you get some books that apparently have very suggestive images in them. And you read them for XP, obviously. <laughs> and that's all it says is that there's very suggestive images. And, yep. you know, we learn more as we go deeper into the site. But um, nonetheless, I'll kick it back to you at this point. Yeah, so other artifact, artifacts you find on here, you've got wine glasses, you've got shisha pipes, which are just absolutely hilarious. Um, Zamorakians just getting off their tits. In the basement, always good. Um, and some art. You find art down here as well. Let me just get my... Yeah, that was a fun one because that's actually for that uh, art collection that finishes at 89 Archaeology because I just did that one. And that gives you that Zamorakian art, the replica art, uh, if you want to put that in your uh, archaeology office for that. Yeah, you can hang up the art. Um, I love the inclusion of stuff like art in the skill in general. Yeah, um, it really fleshes it out and just gives it that whole extra complete feeling behind it. Yeah, it's completely unnecessary, but I think it adds a lot. It kind of adds a culture side of things that would be absent otherwise. Yeah. yeah. Um, and they look really good. Like abstract Zamorakian art, it looks really great. It's really on brand and in character. And yeah, it just looks fantastic. All right, so after the... After we move through the Star Lodge cellar, what happens then? Or where do we go next? Do we want to cover the lore book here, or do we want to come back and do that? Uh, let's cover the lore book here. Let's, let's, go in, let's just go. I, I thought we'd do it in the other way, but let's do it in, uh, in order as you move through the dig site, because I think that's more of a natural flow for this. So that yeah, would be the, eyes in the, their stars, right? Yes, yeah. So you uncover four pages of the Founder's Journal, uh, which was written by the founder of the Star Lodge and founder of the Order of Dis. Um, which is the Zamorakian cult that the Star Lodge was the front for. Um, and it kind of gives a information of from very early Third Age, I reckon, um, about what the Lodge was for, how it came to be, and you know what they were up to down there. And that's the sense that I got is that it was uh, early Third Age on that, just you know, based on the wordings and whatnot. That were yes, it's kind that. of in the period when Zamorak was away, inverted commas, on yeah. uh, Infernus. So right. when he was on the Demon Homeworld and couldn't come back to Gilinor, uh, this is what his supporters were up to. Um, this was a really weird time, I think, for Zamorakian supporters because he had won his little rebellion. He had, you know, killed Zaros and thrown that all into chaos yeah. and then immediately left. Right. So there's this huge power vacuum in the Empire Zaros is dead. He's gone. Um, who sweeps in but the Saradominist forces? So all Zamorak's supporters are now incredibly vulnerable and being attacked by Saradominist. And they can't really do anything until Zamorak comes back. I think 12 years later, I think it's a 12 or 13 year gap where they're just completely vulnerable without their leader. And I, I think found, found the location of it very interesting as well. Like, it feels like the Saradomin spot and the Zamorak spot are sort of the other way around right now. Like, right now, the Varric area is very Saradomist, and, well, then you have Vampires, which is like the whole other side. Um, 
how was that? Was that the same already in the third age? Like, I'm not sure how things Let like the vampire stuff compares. So, to... yeah, yeah. Um, the Zorosian Empire was from where the archaeology campus is now. Um, that's where the empty throne room is. Yeah. And it was the entirety of Forent Three, which is now the wilderness. Mm -hmm. So if you have a look on the map, it's that whole kind of central area. Mm -hmm. And it stretched down south to Al-Karid. Uh, Karadet was the bottom, like the southern border of it. Uh, Mauritania was Sardominus territory in the Third Age. In the Second Age, sorry. Yep. Um, because of the Icene. Because of the Icene. We know that was where the Icene was. And then what happened was when Zamorak came back, he took Sentistan as the capital. This was something I wasn't too clear on until kind of through this skill. Um, but Sentistan is then referred to as his seat of power. So he comes back to Sentistan and takes it for himself. Yeah, that's, just, that's, uh, that's, that's what I always imagined. And, and this kind of reaffirmed it in seeing this is that, you know, previously Zaros controlled that whole area, then... Zamorak rebels and takes that entire area surrounding it northward, yeah. so to speak. And then and the Zarosians are just left with the Korea yeah. dig site kind of area. And Santistan is below the dig site, right? The original dig yes, site. Yeah, so it's kind of slightly east from Barok. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and then Mauritania, Zamorakians moved out. Well, the vampires, I don't know whether they're strictly Zamorakian or not, moved out east, took over Mauritania. I, I, th then, I think you can say there's they're Zamorakian because you know if you look at God Wars Dungeon One, you definitely see them there. That's true. They did break away at some point in the Third Age. Um, the Dracons went off and did their own thing, but I think broadly vampires are Zamorakian. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so they then they then spread out east and took over um, Hallowvale and turned it into Mauritania. Yeah, and and I, I'm guessing throughout this whole thing, Falador was another like kind of Ceredominus sanctuary. Falador didn't least. exist. Oh, it didn't exist. Okay. No, Falador. See, I think all the modern cities that we see here were founded in the last couple of hundred years, so kind of our post Gold Wars. All right, so then just general areas. Then that makes sense. Then fair yeah. enough. Uh, and and you know this is why we're here to ask these questions that everybody would have, <laughs> and we're just clarifying. Um, so in Eyes and Their Stars, you know, after we see this being detailed in the late Second Age and that rebellion bit, what happens after that? Or what, what is detailed in that? Sorry. Uh, so part of the cult's work, and I think the main reason the cult existed after Zamorak left, was to bring him back. Uh, that was their main goal. And they talk about, I think, on the, in the second page, that they're breaking down a gate from St. Tistan and smuggling it into the lodge and they're trying to rebuild it there and that's all we know at that point so they're rebuilding some kind of gate to the source and kind of we know this place is called the infernal source yeah. they're kind of accessing it here and that kind of starts building as a player anticipation of what we're going to find when we go further into the lodge and we and know then, and we know what that was but we'll we'll save that until we get down uh into yeah. the next part but I, i'm distracting from eyes and their stars so continue that's right uh then there's a couple of time skips. So kind of in the third page, on the third page, you go forward a bit in time, the gates built, the source appears to be active because they're talking about sacrificing someone to a demon, to Dagon. And we know he's a demon because there's a talk about contracts here. Right. And that's the kind of the first mention of demon contracts we get in this site and kind of the start of the player discovering more about ancient summoning, which then leads through to actually using it right at the end of the site. Uh, da -da -da. Yeah, and then the fourth page, the final one, um, is just before Zamorak returns. Kind of, they've built the gate, they've been successful, he's coming back. Um, and the reason I put this bit in is because there's, there's one line in it that reads, there's one trophy in particular I wish to show him when he returns, the head of Auriculus. And that's kind of sad to me, because Auriculus and the Salus are two demons we've seen before. Um, they were very... They're blood reavers. Uh, Ocellus is now a guardian of Guthix, and he created the Monastery of Ascension. So if you've ever been to the Ascension Dungeon, he's kind of the great big tentacle beast. Interesting. Okay. Out front. I have no idea how he became the guardian of Guthix. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. Um, it's probably someone probably knows more about it than me. 
Um, but it's kind of sad that we now know Auriculus is dead. Um, he was hunted by, I presumably this cult and killed. And I think, yeah, you f- you find something related to him when you go into the source itself. Um, I hope that made sense. I feel yeah. like I'm rambling a bit. No, I, 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 I think that's good. Tannis, any questions on that? As I mean, no, I'm just, you said you were coming I'm, in as the Lord Noob, so I figured I'd ask. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, Taking it all in. All right. And then, you know, uh, that's what you find out at this point. So I, I, I quite liked how this started to bring in elements of what we'd find later on and kind of starts to set the scene for what kind of story we're going to uncover as we go through it. Yeah. And, and you know, I think this is, you know, I, maybe I'm wrong on this and maybe this is why we should be giving more to the, inf- to the infernal source than we have is that in this first series of lore book pages which you know you can get relatively early on in archaeology completed all by 68 so you can get this first batch really early on maybe this is the hook for some people who are uh, who deem themselves on the lore side that needed to be hooked into the skill that would be that hook because when you think about it if you look at all the other dig sites their lore is a bit more spread out in terms of, you know, you're waiting until the mid to high levels to, you know, gain access to the majority of it or complete it. Whereas by mid levels, you've have the potential to complete all of infernal source. And what I'm saying on this is that perhaps my overlooking infernal source was that I just took this lore connection for granted. Whereas if there was a new player coming in and they saw all this lore, maybe that would be the hook for them. And the reason why infernal source would be special. I can see that, yes. And um, I think you're right. Because there is quite a lot of information just in that first journal, almost. Right. Um, it, and it does cover quite a major point in Gillinor's history. Like, the return of Zamrak's quite big. It's what kicked off the Third Age and the, the yep. God Wars in earnest. Yeah. Um, so it's shedding light on quite a, a major event. All right. Uh, what's next? Should we go into the Dungeon of Disorder? Dungeon of Disorder. Let's keep going. All right. And and this was so this was the part where it got really weird for me. So I'll just let you describe it. Okay. So you go in behind the fireplace, and the first room you come to is looks relatively normal. There's some tables and chairs hanging around. It's like okay, we're more of a, you know, if this was the underground bar, maybe this is the the bar under the bar. And then you go down this little passageway. And you're met with a sacrificial altar. Straight up, horned skull, blood on the floor. Yep. Like, wham, slap in the face. This is what this place is used for. It um, wasn't even subtle, was it? No, no subtlety whatsoever. Just straight in, they've been killing people here. They've been sacrificing people to a demon. Um, yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's much else to say. About and that's that what the order, difference. and that's what the order of this is about. Yeah, I think what I quite liked here is that it's almost—I don't know whether it counts as environmental storytelling because it lets you know exactly what's going on yeah. here without any more drops or anything. It's just straight in. Oh, now we know what's going on. And then if you progress um, a little bit further, there's uh, there's some cells. Yes, yeah, so you find a full-on torture chamber. I do quite, just a little point, I do quite like the level design of this bit because yeah. it's really small and concise, but it's quite well laid out in that you can't really see what's beyond the corners until you get there. And then, so you still get surprises while it being, it is still quite small and localized area, which then, is neat. Then at the end, you come to this circular chamber and there's chalk and, oh, you need to draw these chalk lines on the ground and then, you know, use this bloody candle and you're going to perform this ancient ritual. So yeah, this is what the dungeon of disorder is all about. Ancient mm. ritual and sacrifice. Yep. Straight in very Zamorakian, very much yeah. in keeping with what we know so far. Like, um, yeah, it, it fits the brand as it were. Does I, it finds like Zamorakian culture is like, it's a bit of a roller coaster. I think Zamorak was always seen or portrayed even as evil versus Saradomen as good, right? Yes. That was, that was before I mean, that was, 2013. Like, that was RuneScape Classic, right? There was yep. good, evil, and balance. That yep. w- those were the three gods that existed. 
and you really saw that you know a lot of people didn't really like Zamorak and a lot of people would for Saradomin like first world event was a good indication of that then we found out that Saradomin is actually a bit of a bastard and in Dishonor Among Thieves Zamorak comes across almost sympathetic like you don't have to agree with him but the ideology he has there is something to say for it right like there's there's reasoning and all that so i think that really it caused zamorakianism to not just be evil but much more subtle and interesting and then you come into this dungeon or this this dig site where you have a sacrificial altar uh you know you have like manacles and a torture room and you basically go into hell once again throwing all the subtlety out of the window and going full on on like these are the bad guys which doesn't that sort of invalidate all we I, learned about him. No, that's how the followers are representing him. This is something I find quite satisfying about RuneScape, uh, their portrayal of religion in particular. Mm-hmm. It's the demarcation between the religion and the yep. figurehead. That's exactly and what I meant by the followers. Of different types of faith you get within one religion. Bingo. Like some Zamorakians are absolute bastards. Some of them are evil, sadistic murderers. Some of them seem to be Less so. Some Saradomists are, you know, normal people. Some of them are fanatics. Like, mm. and, and, they, and those people are then separate from the gods themselves. And having corporeal gods stomping around is always really interesting because there's always a difference between how they're perceived and what they're actually like as a person because they are people rather than concepts, which is what, you know, some religions portray So, so in some ways, then, this is, this is very good social commentary, then. It's kind of social commentary. It's also a little bit more subtle than some MMOs have. Yep. Um, and it leaves like room re- for interpretation too. Yeah, and it leaves room for players to take things as they want, which is always cool. Um, especially in a role playing game, everyone has their own interpretation of what's of how things go and so who they how, want to. Play. Is there a way to find out what? Like, I know that you can talk to Armadillo about Stormguard. Can you talk to Zamorak about the Infernal Source? Oh, I wish. I wonder. I haven't tried yet. Um, but it's also worth saying that with Zamorak and Zamorakianism in particular, he never really intended to have a great big religious following. That just kind of happened and he rolled with it. Hmm. Yeah, because like, it started it with the rebellion. Yeah, it started with the rebellion. And I cannot remember the law, the law book that went into this. I think it is in Nakra's memory from the Majorat Memory series. But Zamrat came back as a divine being, but Majorat already divine being, so that wasn't really much of a difference. He was just a lot more powerful. Uh Um, And then mortals started rallying around him as a god. And he went, oh, that's nice, I'll keep that. But he didn't do anything to discourage it. He just let them do whatever they want, which is at the core of Zamorakian philosophy. It's freedom to do whatever you want, good or bad. Uh Uh Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And having the strength to defy people who tell you no. And this is one thing that we learned a lot about, you know, in Dishonor Among Thieves, as you mentioned, and it cast an entire new light on Zamorakianism. And, you know, as we're saying here in this dig site, that can happen here with this too. And I'm wondering is that, you know, we had World Event 1 back in 2013, Sarah Doman versus Zamorak that long ago. I think the outcome of that would have been different had we had Dishonor Among Thieves first. Then my question oh, is, yeah. would the lore that we're getting in this scale have further changed that outcome? I wonder. I wasn't actually around for World Event 1, so I don't really know what went down there. But um... Well, people were still under operating under the assumption of Sarah Doman good, Zamorak evil. Let's side with Sarah Doman. Other than that, you didn't miss much. It was a grind fast. <laughs> yeah. See, I, I think I... A... Sarah Doman gained some power, Zamorak lost some power. Yeah. I restarted playing RuneScape 3 not long before Dishonor Among Thieves came out. So I think that was one of my first contacts with Zamorakianism as a, as a mm-hmm. philosophy. 
which might be why I'm relatively sympathetic towards it. Right. Who knows? <laughs> All right, um, so I, I, yeah, let's I, talk I, about the mystery in the Dungeon of Disorder. Uh, embrace the chaos is what you find in Dis- Dungeon of Disorder. And when you strip this one back, this is the instructions for how you open the portal. And they could have made it really dry. They could have just had it as find this, do that, da 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 da, da. But instead, they fluffed it up really nicely um, and made it as a diary of a human, a cultist, Sir Francis Dashwood, who's this dry, sarcastic, he doesn't really want to be there, he's really fed up with it all, the cult's fallen into disrepute, or not disrepute, it's not really relevant anymore, which tells you that uh, you've skipped forward in time by the time you find this journal. Um, Zamorak's back, so the order of this isn't really important. Um, And you find out about a really unexpected character, I think you say it's Cyrus? Is that how you say it? Yeah, I think so. Um, Who's kind of his roommate. And they're complaining about his roommate and da 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 da. And it turns out in the very last entry that Cyrus is a demon. And I love that twist because it flips what we think we know about demons on its head a bit. Um, it's like he's saying, Syrian, that demons have been portrayed as this bad, evil thing. Mm-hmm. And here we've got one who plays practical jokes and seems relatively harmless. Like that, that's quite nice. I thought that was a nice bit of. Um, almost like a plot twist um yeah, yeah combining and, and, and you know and you know reading this i thought okay this is getting interesting and if this can happen to this one guy what other kind of are there other demon creatures like this that we might have interacted with in any of the quests that's tangentially or directly related to zamorak mm. Mm. that was a and question I did like this raised how... for me yeah, com- combining the, the instructions to how to open the portal with this little slice of life type description of what these people were doing was just a nice way of fleshing it out, um, kind of adding in some more flavor to what would otherwise have been quite a, you know, inconsequential thing to find. Yeah, and, um, you know, I, I really enjoyed doing the the little puzzle down there to put together back the portal again because it actually felt and this is probably due to the environment the music and the reading that you do beforehand but it felt like you were doing something that you might potentially regret putting it back together. i was very excited putting the portal together because this is where we find oh okay we're actually going to go into the source now and we don't know what the source is yet but we just know it's a place where demons come from what are we going to find down here let's open the portal and find out and then and then I think and this is the this is the point where when you enter this portal and you know embrace the chaos was like you said pretty much an instruction set and it's the build up to what happens next and I think this was my first wow moment in the skill graphically oh, when you enter yes very nice little bit of camera placement whenever you first enter the source um most times when I go in it my camera's kind of placed behind me yeah so you don't really see what's going on. So then when you zoom out and turn around, you get that incredible lighting. And this this environment is just, a, oh. And the perception of the scale, not only vertically, but looking down. down. I don't know, so I don't know where incredible. else in game they do uh, the, the verticality except down. I don't, it just I don't looks know fantastic, like doesn't it? Yeah. The lighting is insane. Have you gone back the little... since they added depth of field and turned that on? Yeah, yeah. It's a place that really benefits from that. Um, and the little bits of ash floating down from the sky and the lava. Oh, yeah. first thing I did when I got here the first time was just go into free cam and spend about half an hour just <laughs> missing rounds going, wow. And this you're actually amazing. under the wilderness with this. And yeah, you're under the volcano. This is under the wilderness volcano. And there was, I think I heard somewhere that there was some discussion that they were considering if they should actually make this part of the wilderness. But they thankfully decided oh, against God. that. Damn. Yeah, no, I wouldn't have liked that. <laughs> it's really, t- is it, it, I think it's really telling that the first thing I thought when I got in there, and it shows how mechanics oriented I am, is. Oh my goodness, that's going to be a pain to navigate. Was See, it I though? figured that one out later. 
I mean, it, yeah. it's a little disorientating at times, okay. but my first thought was, wow, this looks incredible. Um, one thing I did love was all the little hexag- hexagonal rocks you get. I don't know why you've noticed them. Oh, basalt. Uh, that makes sense. That's what that is an yeah. That's an environmental callback to the heart of Gilinor. Right. Hexagons everywhere in Talos' boss fight. Right. And this is another environment under the surface of Gilinor. Great big power source. Hexagons everywhere. Mm. The, that little commonality is quite... It, it kind of gives a hint of where you are. And if you've been to Talos' place before, if you've been, you know, played uh, Siska's Endgame, you've been in the heart... Tell us before. <laughs> Who do you think I am? A PVMer? <laughs> well, I don't know. The first thing I tried to do when I got to the source is I tried to go to the bottom. I I saw the bottom and I didn't really work out how to get there. I got distracted by the gargoyle before I got too far. Oh, okay. All right. Um, so, as as we mentioned, there's multiple levels of the source. Uh, how do you want to uh, go through each of these? Do you want to? Uh, I, I guess. Maybe now is a good time to talk about the gargoyle mystery, since you m- mentioned the gargoyle, right? Yeah, let's talk about the gargoyle mystery, and let's talk a bit about uh, Dante's Inferno. Okay, sure, do it. Because um, I mentioned that in the lore dive we did before the skill release, and you were right. I'm very happy I was right because I was very, very wrong about a bit that comes up later on. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, but yeah, the the as it turns out, the Dante's Inferno has had a huge influence on the source's design. Um, a Redditor did a really nice summary of it, and I've put a link to that in at the end of the, the law document I've put together. As someone who actually knows a lot about the literature and the context of it, um, apparently that there's so many callbacks here from even the names of the levels, the harrowing, um, the vestibule futility. Those are all locations in Dante's Inferno. Uh, similarly, with these gargoyles, uh, the 13... All right, Syrian, help me out here. How'd you say it? Uh, I, I, that was the one I couldn't figure out. <laughs> is it like the male branch? Male Mal- branch? No. Mal- branch eh? My Italian Mal- is non-existent. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't know what language it should be in. If it's like Italian, it's probably male branch. Eh? Mal- branch eh? Let's just go ac- with that. You need an accent on the E if you were going to do that. So just go with whatever feels most comfortable. Mal- yeah. Uh, but those are 13 characters in Inferno. Um, and in this site, they've been characterized as guardians of the source and attendants of Dagon. And we'll come to Dagon later. Um, so you enter the source, you come in, you go wow for half an hour, and then you come across Ophiuchus. Sure. Um, Ophiuchus. Ophiuchus. There we go. Syrian knows some oh, Italian. Oh, for you choose. Yeah. I'm not Italian. You know some, though, don't you? What did you no, say? No, I did Latin, so... Did Latin? Oh, okay, close enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, plus, plus, I've seen I've, I've seen some movies with an Italian mafia or something, you know, I just copy the accents from a movie. That's... There we go. That's all you need to do. Um, but yeah, this is how you start contract clause, which is... Yeah, a sequence where you have to free these 13 gargoyles all named after the zodiac signs. Or all, like, not named after, they're represented by zodiac signs. Um, I won't go into the real details of it because from a law perspective, it's not really relevant. Um, you just find an object or do an emote or do something and then you free them and they turn to stone. And they're kind of hinted to too, which is good as to what they're going to yeah, be. You get, clue, you get clues from each one. Um this is another little sequence. I think the point of it is another illustration of what demon contracts do. Um, like these, these things have been contracted to stay here and they've been trapped here because they can't break free of their contracts. Oh, I that's interesting. That's, I never thought of it that way, but it makes a lot of sense now. Yeah. Yeah. Like that's the only reason I could think of this being yeah. in. It's kind of an illustration of what's actually going I on. I think that's good. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. And it's also a little puzzle that you need for the the final mystery for day gone by. Yeah, um, and these and these gargoyles are the things that caused shiny cows to spike to eighty million on day two. Yeah. <laughs> when I first heard about that, and I didn't know about the about why you needed them, I was like, why on earth is everyone getting excited over farming again? 
<laughs> I mean, who wouldn't normally, but that's a topic for another day. Um, so, yeah, that that was, yeah, not a difficult puzzle. It was just kind of a, a shopping list. Yeah. Um, uh, it, it took me it took me some time to get started, mostly. Oh, yeah? Um, yeah. Getting the first hint. Like, once you get the first one, the rest sort of becomes much easier. But just finding a good starting point was the hard thing for me. Okay. I think it's best to start with one of the emote ones. I Yeah, I didn't realize. I was like, nah, that's too straightforward. That's too simple. It can't be that. <laughs> And I wanted to tell you this, but you told me to let you figure it out. Yes. Anyways. Um, and I'm just... So the, the the whole point of contract clause, I think, was, like you mentioned, very little lore consequence to it. But I think it was just to effectively progress through the source. That was the point of this mystery, wasn't it? Yeah, so it's to lead you down to Dagon to give you information about uh, what demon contracts mean. Um, and also, to, I think, to provide some more neutral demonic characters as well. Like, they're neither good nor bad. They're just there. Like and they, the they're not really. Oh, yeah, the little imp. Um, as you go down through the source, you find... Mephisto. What's his name? Mephisto. Uh, who's a little bit of comic relief, to be honest, yeah. in this. In, um, I enjoyed I enjoyed seeing him. Yeah, what you do is he's been trapped by a misfired binding spe- teleportation spell, and you have to do a little slider puzzle to free him. And there's yeah, some see, cute that's why parts. I didn't like seeing him. Like, every time I see him, I'm like, oh, God, another slider puzzle. Why, why do people not like slider puzzles? Oh, I get so tired of doing them. They're so boring. Oh, I don't mind them. I think that can be quite fun. Nah. I mean, doing the same one over and over again is just kind of, yeah. But they're, they're not difficult. Quick, but anyways. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to get down to the sourcing yeah, game here. And, and I've just and, one. And the fun part about that imp for me was the uh, D&D reference to the, you know, you know, the 1D6, for example, yeah. that you roll to um, reduce the chance of your teleport portals from failing. Yeah. Um, so it's worth doing those puzzles because it kind of reduces the chance of the, the portals misfiring. How many times you can you do them? Do the puzzle? I think it's... Ooh, I don't know. I know it goes up to one in a hundred. All right, because I've only oh, done it... We can do the math, right? There's, uh, I, we, we know what dice we have in, in <laughs> Go on, D&D. D&D, where are you? So we have a D4, a D6, D8, D10, D12, D20, and D... Um, D100. Uh, percentile dice, 100. I think you start with a 1 in 4 chance, right? Yeah. Then it goes to six 1 in times. 6. 6 times. So okay. that's... Uh, that's not too bad. Though. Yeah, 6. Yeah. Um, and, you know, this for me at the beginning, it wasn't clear that you could do it more than once, the puzzle. So I, uh, I, I only did it once, and then, you know, going back, I saw the imp again, actually just recently to it and did it again. So I've actually only done it twice and I've really not actually found the puzzles to be that much, or sorry, the portals to be that much of a problem in misfiring. I think Mephisto's name, just looking at how it's spelt, I think it's a reference to Mephistopheles, which is another demon character. Um, just thought I'd throw that in there. Okay. That would make sense. I didn't catch that, but that would make sense. Very good. But yeah, he's just a little bit of comic relief before you go down and hit the the big boy at the bottom. Which is Dagon. Dagon, yes. Dagon and the Hydra Gate. This is where it really gets meaty. And what, so, yeah, what happens down, with this? So you get down to the bottom and you talk with Dagon. And turns out he is... So he was first mentioned right at the start of the, the site. Yep. In uh, stars, eyes in their stars, sorry. And he had human sacrifices made to him. So he's obviously this great, big, terrifying thing. Uh, um, it turns out he was summoned by this founder of the Star Lodge as part of the method for rebuilding the gate. I couldn't find anywhere any information about why he's necessary to the gate. I don't know if I've missed that, but why is he there? I don't know. I don't but- have anything I can add to that. Huh? You fell the door. <laughs> we don't talk about that show here. <laughs> um, but I think it is safe to assume that he's somehow necessary for the gate to open. 
Um, and he's been trapped here for thousands of years now. Um, yeah, and the player's the first human he's seen for a very, very long time. And we free him for some reason. I think he, let me just try to find the, this is Day Gone By. The yep, mystery Day Gone mystery By. mystery Day Gone By. Um, and yeah, he persuades you to free him from wherever he's trapped, um, which is the Hydra Gate. Hang on, I'm just trying to find a... And and one of the interesting things about actually going down here is that you know when you get the when you first get in there up at the top you don't specifically know what you're going to expect with this and then you go through the actions of talking with Dagon and you know interacting with the Hydra Gate which we'll get to. Um, one thing that I'd really like to see happen uh, following from this and you know you guys can shoot me if I'm wrong in terms of the implications that I'm making up on this maybe this would be a good way for them to finish floor 61 of Dungeoneering kind of link these two kind of things together how would they link that I don't know and that's why I said if this is a horrible idea just tell me and we'll shoot it down I don't think it's a horrible idea I think it's they're quite similar areas in that Dungeoneering uh, floor 60 of Dungeoneering. Let's see if I can remember the lore behind that. Yeah. And 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 I think we mentioned this on the lore deep dive too. Uh, yeah. In particular 61 of the Samarakan headquarters. Yeah. There you go. I don't think it's linked to the demon homeworld in any way. Yeah. So. Oh, so well. what we get. Oh, wow. Well. Um, but yeah, I remember in that lore dive, I predicted that we might find something like Hestilius at the bottom of the source. Which we didn't. Which we didn't. But we did find something else. We did find the Hydra, which is, you know, that's also pretty cool. And I mean, if you're going to be wrong about one thing, that's something okay to be wrong about because you got so many other things right with this. So I wouldn't worry too much about that. Yeah, close enough. Close enough. Two out of three. Yep. Um, it is, uh, it, was, it was kind of, well, maybe not sad, but uh, you're sort of forced to release the demon in the end. Like, yep. you get a choice in, in, the, in the dialogue, but one choice basically doesn't, lead you anywhere like at least you yeah, have to wanna, if you want to progress and finish the site you have to free him yeah which uh, yeah i don't know i know you like your player choice and i like my player choice and i know it's not really feasible maybe but then don't give me a fake choice right that 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 was a bit like yeah that was I, your whole problem with desperate times i made the decision to feed a demon because I wanted to unlock ancient summoning, which is a meta decision and not like a character decision. Yeah. I think that I look just um just trying to look up the dialogue again, see if I can remember it. But I think that was the exchange. You said if you free me, I will teach you how to make demon contracts. Yeah. And this is how you unlock ancient summoning. You do the little puzzle, you do the Dagon by puzzle using the information you've collected in contract clause. And then once he's freed um, there's a very interesting little piece of little exchange where the player expects Dagon to attack them because, oh, he's a freed, angry demon. And Dagon says, no, I'm not going to do that. I made you a promise. I'm going to keep my word. You know, that doesn't strike me as very demonic. But again, it's another point of this site and going back to Cyrus in the in the dungeon. It's kind of oh, what we know about demons maybe isn't true mm-hmm. about all of them. I'm I'm kind of expecting... I kind of expecting this to come up in a quest somewhere, but because a sixty-eight archaeology requirement doesn't yeah. sound too crazy for me. Yeah, it so it's probably, probably going to show up in a, in, a, in, in a quest somewhere. What mm. I'm gonna wonder is, like, what I totally see happening is this going to be turned around on our head again, where we ask the demon to do something, and he does it, but he does it like very literally, or like you know, mm. does does it like. In this a way is, that ends up benefiting him. This is another thing we learn all the way through this site is how is kind of the mechanics of demon contracts and how it's all down to the interpretation of the words you use mm-hmm. in the exchange I with Dagon. I think Dagon. that's going to bite us back in yeah. in a butt in a future quest. That's I think where it's going to go. Like right now, it's setting this all up. It's like demons aren't that bad. They're actually quite nice. Well, I nice. Think they're, gonna t- I think they're not all inherently evil. I think is the conclusion to draw. Here. 
yeah. not that they're, nice. they're just they're not inherently terrible. I'm 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 yeah. I'm I'm expecting that's going to be turned on its head again. Mm. And maybe that's not so bad, but uh, yeah, we'll see. But yeah, the exchange that Dagon says, it says, um, my contract states that I might only break it if this place were to fall into enemy hands. And the player says, are you calling me an enemy? Dagon says, for the purposes of my contract, you would be. So everything's about the interpretation of the words and that kind of pedantic, literal um, <laughs> word. In it. I love that. Yeah. And that's how you free him. And there's a little note about Dagon that I want to end this one on, or and this little piece about him on. So he describes himself as an infernal. Sure. And I missed this first time round. And I thought maybe that means he's just a resident of Infernus. But we know that infernal demons were an entire race of demon. They were like you've got three in the RuneScape lore: the Avernix, which are kind of the the most common ones that we find now. Um, they're kind of the slightly bestial ones that we find running around. Uh, you have the Chthonians, which were the ones that ruled Infernus before Zamrak went there, teamed up with the Avernix and killed them all. Uh, and then you have the Infernals, who were basically what the Chthonians are to Avernix. Um, but like they were like the ruling race of the Chthonians, if that makes sense. And... I think what from what we know, they were wiped out years and years ago. So is, is this a survivor, or am I reading too much into that? Hmm. Did that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. I'm, I'm just trying to think about the ramifications of that uh, for questions. I could very much just be reading too much um, into that. And I, I think if you look back on it as a whole, it certainly feels as though he is one of the few that is left. And that's the sense that I got just on a metal hole from this site. And yes, he does. So he's like, he's, I don't think he's like many demons we've met before. Right. Um, well, could he end up being kind of like our guide to demon lore and the demon world, like how Thanic was kind of with us? Through the that would be Goblin cool. Storyline. I think I you're more right than you. The there's more line. chance of you being right than not. So that's good. Are we going to get to see Infernus at some point? Ooh, that would be fun. Yeah, and, and you know, that's another option from this is that following from this, you might as well uh, have the jumping off point to this to be something in furnace space. And they did talk about doing the hostilious boss before. So that could be something that could be done somewhere with this. And if you go down to the very bottom here, there's plenty of places that, you know, a different portal could just open up. It could even be, you know, a portal of flame um, in relation to that. So, and I know yeah. at Dag and Bai, you were also going to talk about the various, you wanted to talk about the various weapons that you would find inside uh, this dig site and how that related into the lore. Yeah, so uh, once you finish Dag and Bai, uh, he asks you to retrieve two weapons for him, his Hellfire Katars, I think. And in exchange, you get an artifact, you get the Rings of Razuli. Yeah. Um, but... I've just put this almost in like a little bit of an Easter egg. I really liked how the convention for naming demonic weaponry is based on Indian weapons and kind of subcontinent Southeast Asian weapons. Um, so I think that there's five or six weapons that are named and you can excavate them as art, as um, kind of in the excavations all the way through the, the infernal source. Um, so you've got, Oh my god, I'm really going to <laughs> mess this up. But if you want to see all the details there in the law documents, I put some photos in from museum collections. They're all based on real life weapons. Yeah. And um, usual show notes update.rsbmb.com. Yeah. yeah. Um, and but you I know, thought that was quite an interesting convention to go with because I can't remember an MMO that's ever looked into that. Precisely. And, you know, it, it, you can say that that is a touch on to the real world in that. But at the same time, um, Every game has to take its sources from something real world based and, you know, just having these and associating them with this artifact, I think is a, it's a good way, uh, it's a good form of commentary, I feel. 
Yeah, I don't. It's. I. I just struck me as quite interesting and unusual to draw on uh, that convention to then base the weapons off. Um, and it's nice having a consistent convention. I thought that was pretty good, having that consistency. And there are similar things for other dig sites, but that's not the topic of this one. That'll be the topic for uh, our next Deep Lord dive, which I'm really enjoying this. Uh, Sirion Tannis, are you guys enjoying this too? I hope I'm not rambling too much. No, I do feel of like course I'm not. <laughs> um, I think the, the coolest weapon of the ones that are offered is the Arumi, which is... Oh, it's a steel whip. So it's like, like three or four feet sword, but it's got this really flexible, sharp blade. So you're going around with, you know, several feet of razor steel. Does anyone wish we could have these in game as actual usable weapons? Terrifying weapon. Looks insane. Um, that, yeah, I, I, I quite like that uh, launching off point to create things in game from a real life um, area that we I haven't really seen before in an MMO. All right. Um, yeah, not like a bunch ahead, of Englishmen have ever taken anything from India before. I mean, <laughs> That's a discussion for someone else's podcast. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, anything else on Dagon Bai or the Dagon and the Hydrogate that you want to mention before we talk about some of the research assignments? So how does about- uh, Dagon relate to... Um, well, the ropes we have, Dagon High ropes. Don't know. I hadn't noticed that. Same. I don't have an answer for you on that one. I mean, Dagon Boy is a pun on Dagon High, right? Right? I thought it was a pun on Days Gone By. Yeah, that's what I thought. Or that's what oh. I thought anyway. But you're right, the Dagon High are uh, another Zamorakian cult. Maybe there's something there. I don't know. Oh. Well, I, I guess that's another part of research we could look into. Our dag and high and dag and by opposite. <laughs> or is it just something so simple as days gone by for dag and by? I thought it was days gone by, but I don't know. Can I talk about the Hydra Gate briefly? Yeah, please do. Because this was the biggest law reveal for me. I got very excited when I realized what this was. Uh, this is Lornab. Um, this Hydra is called Lornab. And this was a Aww. god. Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, don't you, Syrian? <laughs> um, mm-hmm. Lornab was a god from late First Age lore um, on Gilinor. It was a Hydra, so it was like Tusker in that it was a beast god. It wasn't like a, a, a sentient god. Um, and, you know, it had made its home in Gilinor. Humans were in fear of it. It was eating them, so they were sacrificing things to it, worshipping it, trying to keep it away. And Zaros used it to bring his 12 demonic legions to Gilinor. He came here, he brought Duke Nemesis, who was a, a demonic, I think a Thonian duke, um, killed the Hydra and used its 12 heads, kind of wove the 12 heads into a gate, into the Hydra gate, and used its divine energy to open a portal to Infernus, bring over his 12 legions of demons. And that effort it cost the Hydra killed it and turned it to stone. And this is what we see here the 12 heads of the Hydra. Um, And I think after... Yeah, so Zaros brought his 12 legions on and that was where he founded his empire. Um, The full account of it is given in the Codex Ultimatus, which is a reward from the dig site quest. It's the lore lore drop you get from that quest. Um, So yeah, Lornab's a character. Very, very important. Don't really know much else about him other than that. Now we finally get to see him, or what, what became of it. I mean, if you want to see a bit of lore nap without going to an Infernal Source, you can. Oh yeah, there's one of, there's a replica of one of the heads in the Varrock Museum. Exactly. Um, but that's all we know about it previously. Did you just tell someone to go to a museum instead of playing archaeology? Yeah. I mean, it's a oh. museum. It's fine. It's still archaeology related. It's acceptable. <laughs> It's okay. Yeah. Um, wasn't it's full meta? Wasn't Lornap the name? Did that come from like a competition at some point? I don't actually know. I don't know that much where it came from. I have no idea. I have no idea on that. And you know, I, I think what we have just described here 
and I think I'm right on this, is that, you know, I said I wasn't hooked into Infernal Source. But for somebody who is doing archaeology, it only takes to level 68 to get to this point where you can reach full mystery completion in the Infernal Source. And if you look into this and you follow the uh, supplemental sources with this, this is the hook for lore in archaeology, I have to say. I'm 100, I'm 100% convinced of it now that this is what this dig site Infernal Source is for, amongst other things. I think you're right, because it's quite a major lore conclusion to reach before you even get halfway through the skill. Yeah. Um, so I suppose it's kind of, here's your big first, I suppose you compare it to how the experience curve works. You get the little bits, the little bits, then you get the big experience drop. Here's your first big lore drop exactly. that then spurs you into keep going for the, to and, look for more. And I mean, level 68 for all intents and purposes is mid-level, low mid-level. Is that about halfway? That, that's what I'd I say. Know. I'd say low mid-level yeah. just based on, um, you know, the average level for players is anywhere from 65 to 72 in all the skills except for archaeology, so mid-level for sure. Mm. Lore nap is a reference to the term lore noob. <laughs> Not even kidding. Well, that's, that's I love that. Well, that's, that's perfect. That's perfect for us clan questers then. I had the no name idea was that. the Absolutely. name was suggested by Mod was suggested to Mod Jack by a player in game. Mod Osborne approved it. Brilliant. I had no um, idea. That's brilliant. <laughs> the Dimension of Disaster also has a separate story for um, Lower Nab. Oh, what's mentioned there? Uh, he became known as the Dark Imperator and in some ways fulfilled the role that Zaros had in the main universe. Okay, yeah, that makes sense because um, it was the same area. It was the same area as in Tiston. Uh, he was uh, eventually killed by uh, Zamorak. Who led a rebellion against Lord Nap <laughs> in the in the yeah? That's the alternate universe quest. The, yeah, um, that's the uh, that's the dimension of disaster. Kind of your your alternate. And actually, uh, Iklavin uh, actually also started a rebellion, but saw how awesome Lord Nap was and defected. Ha! Huh. Oh, that's a whole different kettle of fish, though. <laughs> All right, there should we go. move on to uh, research now? Uh, just, you know, give a quick rundown on this, because, I mean, there's really, I don't know that there's much lore to take from these. We can just kind of give a brief summary of uh, each of the research that we've been able to take so far. Yeah, go for it. All right. Um, so, you know, as you progress through the dig site, you and you know, you, we were talking about object outlining before. This is definitely one thing that can help with finding these hot spots to study to unlock the research is object outlining. Just move your mouse around and whatnot. Um, the first one, starry eyed in uh, the Star Lodge, which uh, the paperwork at the dig site suggests that it was named Star Lodge, and records show that it was buried by the four and three explosion, which we don't all know what that is, right? That was that big explosion that converted what was previously known as four and three into what we see as the wilderness today, which is the desolate wasteland that it is. And then of course we have the bar that's uh, sitting right on top of it there. And I, I don't know, do, do you think there's any connection why they decided to place this one so close to the bar? I mean, it makes sense lore wise, but is there supposed to be some connection between the Jolie Bar Inn and Infernal Source, do we feel? If there is, we haven't found it yet. Yeah. And that's kind of what it was advertised as when they were selling archaeology and Infernal Source, is that there was going to be a connection. But we unfortunately didn't find it. It's just you know right outside, in close mm. proximity to it. The next one was titled uh, The Dark Underbelly from the Dungeon of Disorder, which says symbology found in the dungeon matches that of a rumored cult known as the Order of Dis, previously only thought to be a myth. It seems these followers of Zamorak hid under plain sight in the auspices of Ceridoman and kept their presence secret for an age. And now the question I have looking at this, because if you look at the research that you do for the uh, – skill at the research or at the archaeology guild 
I think you're going to get better experience from the lore if you actually go and get the lore books itself. And it provides a much more organic experience, whereas the research team is kind of just providing an abridged version of it, it seems, right? I've never really gotten anything out of it. Yeah. I'll be honest. Like... I think it's a summary. It's just a quick summary for maybe people who aren't so familiar with it. Or maybe people who don't want to go back and read the entire law books. Here's your quick summary. Yeah, and, and the difference between this, and we'll get there, is that these start at level 40. But for the Zamorakian research, the last one is at level 98. So you're doing True. research for something that's 30 levels past it. but uh. I think you've got to... To me, it makes sense if you come at it from the perspective of someone who doesn't know what the Hydra Gate is. Okay. Hence the See, research I recognized team. it. Yeah. Um, I knew what it was because okay. I was familiar with the law. If someone was coming in here and knew nothing about the law and they find this many-headed Hydra Gate and that this may, might be their first time they hear about Lornab. Sure. Um, so it kind of makes sense to me. I see why they put them in. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not saying they're a bad thing to put in. And it, it was just odd that, you know, maybe if you are a person who is, you know, kind of just thumbing through the lore and then you get to level 98 and you do the research, maybe that'll uh, pique your interest on this as we progress through this. But the next one uh, is Abandon All Hope, and this is found in the source. Research Place is the infernal source directly be below the wilderness volcano. So this is once again providing supplemental information that we knew going in. And mm -hmm. to think this place was here abandoned all this time. The research team have reported on a very vocal imp being found in this area and suggest you investigate. <laughs> of course, that's Mephisto. Yeah. Deeper and down, that demonic uh, remains even exist in this space and fossilized form suggests this space may cross over with infernal space in some way. One of the hellhound skulls has a dog collar placed around its neck, sporting the name Duke. And this is something... Go ahead. Sorry, that's a call back to the Founders Lodge uh, yep. journal um, because that was Duchess Philippa Wharton. I think that was her name. Uh, her pet hellhound was Duke. Yeah, and, and lots of animal references throughout this too, even in, in the artifacts and whatnot uh, that you unearth throughout the entire Infernal Source. Um, and then the next one is Who Dis, which you get from the Dagon Overlock. Which is, you know, just absolutely funny the way it says, who dis? Um, but anyways, <laughs> what we can see from the level above is that the demon below is trapped somehow. It's also surrounded by a 12-headed circular statue, but we are not quite sure what any of it means at this point. We need to get closer, but the portal is too chaotic. We need to figure out how to make it work. And then finally, at level 98, you have Hellmouths, which is for the Hydra Gate. And your researchers say, wow, what a find. Researchers have found the Hydra Gate was at one point a living creature. The petrified remains appear to match the descriptions of an ancient deity named Larnab, and that is, is it right there. Canonifying? Is that the word? Larnab, once again, in RuneScape. It's official. It's yeah. official. And they say it still hums with a small amount of residual energy. See, I don't think I said before, but... Um... Yeah, Lorna, this gate is the gate to Infernus. This is how you get to the demon homeworld, and it's where Zamorak came back through and um, where presumably demons come through. Yeah, and, and the question is, are we, what, what's going to happen with this going forward? Oh, I really want to go there now. Just so what, what Tannis said, it would be so, so cool to go to Infernus. Yeah, I'd and, love that. And, I, and I'm wondering if we're going to see this in any of the quests that are coming up following from this. Yeah. So. That'd be um, very exciting. All right. So following from research, I think we just have to go through any questions that Sirion, Tannis, and myself have. I don't have any I would have asked them if I did. Uh, Tannis, you got any questions you want to bring up through this endeavor? I mean, Diane, uh, Diana really spelled it out like perfectly. Um, oh, thank you. I learned a lot. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I hope I, I haven't been too. As it came. <laughs> I hope I haven't been too kind of jumping around all over the place no, about no, this. No, I, no, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Sirian, you have any questions? No, I think that was all right. right, crystal clear. And I know Diana, you do have two, una two unanswered questions or so. So, what exactly 
do you feel yeah, so, is being left behind that we need to answer in the future? So there's two questions, I think. Um, the first one is kind of to do with how the gate works, because Lornab's dead, or he's petrified. Um, so presumably in the Codex Ultimatus, you hear that his its divine energy was what was used to bring demons over from Infernus. Um, kind of the implication of it, all 12 heads being turned to stone, is that that's no longer as active. Um, how was it then used to bring Zamorak back? And his his Avernic hordes, how were they brought back through the gate if it wasn't active or if the, the source of the energy wasn't there anymore? Um, potentially that's what Dagon's for. Don't know. That, to me, is a bit of a hanging thread. Do the Dragonkin um, come in anywhere? In any of this, at some point, do you think? Oh, Dragonkin. I'm not sure the Dragonkin have any connection to Infernus. All right. Because um, I'm just wondering how, because remember, at the end of Desperate Times, we had Karapak, and in Desperate Measures, we're presumably still going to have Karapak. And I'm betting that there's going to be some connection between each of these dig sites in the next couple of quests that come out, furthering this storyline so i'm just wondering if there's anything that you have in your mind that the dragon Maybe. King might have I, a role with i know there is going to be an orphan dig site yeah that is there on is the book yes, yeah that's confirmed it was at runefest yeah, yeah. there's going to be an anachronia orphan dig site um i don't know if they have any connection specifically with this area but i could be wrong i don't really know what the dragon king were up to in the second and third age um, whether they are around at all. Um, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. maybe they're and, there. and to be maybe, fair, this wouldn't be an un- unanswered question if we didn't have an answer to it, because I don't certainly have an answer unless Syria and Tannis <laughs> have an answer. <laughs> nope. All right. And, you know, this is just one of those mysteries I think that's going to have to get solved over time, and hopefully it's not going to sit for a decade plus like some mysteries in game had before <laughs> and and you know we'll get to see a uh resolution on this in the next year to 18 months or so and what was the next one second one there's no explanation of what the source is huh. we know where it is now we know what it looks like it's this great big underground space very much like the heart of gilinor a uh, great big power source but what is it who made it how did it get there it it does seem to have the order of dis made the lodge and the order of dis brought the gate down here but they didn't make the source the source predates them they built the lodge in an area where they could access the source so what is oh. this place where did it come from could one of the elder gods have made it maybe maybe <laughs> There is Elder when God connection. Well, you don't know, just blame the Elder Gods, right? Well, there, there is a big Elder God connection to archaeology, but I'm not going to go into it just yet. I will leave that for when I know more about it myself. Um, but they are to do with all of this. It's so full, Elder... isn't it? With the Elder oh. Kiln. And oh, it's very much in her style. It, that's exactly what I was thinking. Underground, um, fire... Um, there was the, the, the Tazar kind of creatures. That was Fool's doing. It might be her. I don't know. But that that was the biggest question when I was just finishing up this document and going, right, what have I missed? It's like, what is this place? No one's ever actually told us what's doing here. Um. But yeah, that, that's that's the second, and I think the bigger question is where did this space come from? And we're left on the edge trying to figure that out. And I bet there's going to be an answer at some point in the future on that. Because, I hope so. you know, everything so far in the skill has been thought out to a T. And to just leave things hanging like this and not answering them wouldn't continue the effort that they have done before on that. Um, Ooh, I got an idea. How about we we'll wait for two years and then have an unsatisfying end? No, please no. No. Oh, oh, please no. <laughs> Tannis, don't do this to me. <laughs> I thought that was the thing now. That's what we, that's what this skill's got me back into RuneScape. Don't make me lose it again. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else on this? Or shall we move on to our listener question for the week? I think we're good then. I'm going to take that as we're good. I think we're I've, good. T- I've talked enough. And 
by the way, everybody, I hope that you have enjoyed this lore talk. There's going to be four more of them. So if you have questions or feedback or things you think we should talk about that we didn't or a different way of talking about it, any feedback that you have, just send that to us in any of the usual ways. Ping one of us on Discord. Send it on Twitter. Contact us at RS. I'm Shane12088. Uh, just let us know what you thought of this. If you like it, you want more of it, you want us to maybe change something about us, let, it, let us know because this is one of the first times we've done a Laura deep dive like this. So um, I've never done an episode like this before. So if you've got any feedback for yeah. how I've provided the information yeah, or is, anything like yeah. that. This is a new style. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Discord. A new style of production for us on this. And I'll just, you know, say thank you, Diana, for producing this. Because Thank you for inviting me. I've really enjoyed putting it all together. Great segment that you've put together. And I think it covers everything from top to bottom, literally in this case. Um, (laughs) So any feedback send that along to one of us and what's your what's your twitter handle where they can get a hold of you uh, on uh that? oh god that's a very good question hang on what is my twitter handle see yeah yours is one of the hard <laughs> ones that i don't remember uh at dianima rs but i'll i'll copy paste that into the yeah. document if you want and um, just dianima so can, underscore come yell at me for my law opinions come yeah. come sh- tell me how wrong i am because i love fighting about law so <laughs> nice all Please right. feel free to come and do that. So before we go on to our question, I'll just uh, take a moment to remind our listeners about our Patreon page at patreon.com slash rsbnb. And that's where you can support the podcast if you want to monetarily. And, you know, we have lots of wonderful uh, – folks that we have to thank this week. So I'm just going to run through this list of names right now and say thank you to each and every one of you who make this episode and everything we do here possible. So this week we got 29 Let's Go, Brock H, Cameron, Cass, CGB900, Christian S, Diana, Jade Gizmo, JW, James W, Jason S, Joe M, John P, Jelly, Kyle, Nora, Our Memories, Rastafa, Ripeth, The Naked Captain, The Lion, Tom V, and Zez. Thank you all of you for your support. It truly does mean the world to us. And if you want to learn more about what all this is about, just head on over to patreon.com slash rsbnb. And there we have a number of monthly features. We have the monthly bit, which is our monthly bonus show that we record and put out at the start of uh each month there's not gonna be a poll this month i'm doing something special with this one uh stay tuned on that one so it'll be a good one just wait for it we also do have the um inside update post that goes live first week of every month about how we do our SBNB update maybe you'll hear from me maybe you'll hear from one of our hosts just something that you normally wouldn't see on the top of update Then we have the round table, which happens uh, normally on the mid-Saturday of the month, but we did this one early for Double XP Weekend that actually turned into a design session for a potential skilling boss. So if you want to hear what we talked about on that, that's all available on the Patreon website at patreon.com slash rsbnb. And then the last one, of course, is Movie Night, which will be happening next Tuesday, and I can report that the next movie is going to be the second Austin Powers movie. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Uh, Last month we had Rise of Skywalker, and before that was a Star Trek one, so we're well on our way to this. So thank you to everybody who makes this at all all possible. You can sign up for this for as little as a dollar a month, and for that you gain access to the entire back catalog of monthly bits, early access to the show notes, and of course you help fund the cost for hosting and production of rsbnb update for three dollars a month you'll get a special vip rank in discord and i mentioned on the podcast at the start of the month as well as high quality stereo aac versions of the show and finally for five dollars a month you'll get a shout out each and every week on the podcast and you'll gain exclusive access to the outtakes that we use to form the clip show at the end of the year so you can learn more about this at patreon.com slash rsbnb and thanks so much for your support everyone it means the world to us All right. Um, I realized that was a bit of a whirlwind session of RS, but we do have a question from Sunset Fish. What is one update on old school that you wouldn't mind seeing come to RS3? Oh, okay. I mean, actual quests. (laughs) (laughs) Do they have quests over there? Yeah, Yeah, getting a vampire quest coming up very soon. They got a Master Feminine quest as well. Mm. They do seem to be getting more log content than we are at the moment, kind of quest-wise. 
Um, Which it's probably because it's so much easier to make, right? Yeah, they're, uh, they're getting maybe. they're I getting Darkmire on June fourth. Uh, they still have Bounty Hunter on that. I mean, um, they got Song of the Elves recently as well. Yeah, they have got Prithness. Yeah, and, um, and you know, this would be a fun thing to go back and do from our perspective: is do we prefer our Prith or their Prith? Because theirs isn't over the top. <laughs> oh, that's yeah, a good one. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna keep ours, but I will say um, they have Dragon Slayer too, don't they? I would like. They it. do. I, yes. I would like to have that. All right, that would be a cool quest actually, because Dragon Slayer is a bit of an iconic one for both RS3 and old school. So to have a kind of higher level sequel. They even have Monkey cool. Madness too, as well. Really? Yes, mm-hmm. that would be so frustrating, but maybe fun. Is OS becoming the Questers game? I don't think so. Okay, good. RS3 still has more story. Yeah, and and I think is yeah the flagship on that uh, front. Um, you know, I, I, f- I find this a really hard question to answer, but you know. They got an entire new con- continent on their site, right? Well, if we look at actual landmass that we got in RS3, we got Anaconia. Um, that's it. Like, what what other area did we actually get? The Eastern Lands was before that, I guess, but I don't really count that. Because it really was developed feel... over a decade plus. No... The reason I don't really include the arc is because it doesn't really feel like it is full of content, right? Yeah. Yeah, like, I haven't really feels... had a reason to go there for a while. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I think actually sort of a an expansion to the main game world, which is filled with actual content, just more of like actual explorer explorable area uh would be super interesting um i think not that we need it but you know you could always choose to declutter some of the main stuff like if you add more mining spots there then maybe you remove a view from the main world and sort of spread out things a bit more I i think it would be nice just to yeah have something new have something fresh um but uh, it's not a super strong wish. I think mostly the quests, like we mentioned. Okay. Uh, I'd love to see that. Do you know what mine is? Uh, no idea. I want their farming guild. Of course you do. Of course what, you do. Um, what, what is in their farming guild? No, I, I actually don't know. Please well, tell me what's in their farming guild. It's more traditional than our farming guild is because, you know, ours is a hub around the player-owned farm. Mm-hmm. There's has farming contracts, kind of like ours does, but theirs is split into three different tiers, yet again, like a traditional guild. It's got a collection of farming patches that are also available in various different types. Apparently they have, you know, cactus, trees, bush, herb patches and whatnot. Um, Then they have a special patch. I'm not sure what these do because, you know, I don't exactly know how they work. They have something called a uh, Hespori patch and an Anima patch. Um, then beyond that in the advanced patch they have another spirit tree there redwood trees as well and you know it's just a more traditional expansion of farming than what we have compared to the player on farm and this isn't saying that the player on farm and the ranch out of time is bad I just feel that this is a more traditional guild and when you say farming guild or ranged guild this is kind of what comes to mind so that's why I'd say the farming guild. I think I think I would like more guilds in general. I actually kind of like like the concept of them. It's a shame that most of them have become obsolete, yeah. especially with the aforementioned fifthness. Yep. <laughs> like, why would you still go to the cooking guild to do your cooking if there's a fire right next to a bank in in, in a tower of voices? Yeah, right? and, and I mean, though, you know, if you don't have Prif, the cooking guild is still a good place to do it. And you can, for all intents and purposes, do your cooking anywhere that's close to a bank in Prif or elsewhere. If you're 99 cooking and you're going for 120 because you slap that cooking mm-hmm. cape on and you don't burn anything. So you can use any fire mm-hmm. or any stove that you want and it's not a yeah. problem. I got my 99 cooking in the cooking guild. You know? Oh, yeah, me was, too. 
nice. really nice and that, that that i don't think that really happens anymore like i never see anyone there i think just you know guilds are actually kind of nice they they revitalized the crafting one and i hope we get see the other ones revitalized a bit as well yeah um but they don't have viable training methods so like even though like when you were talking about um you know cooking at Chris and or cooking here and there i'm thinking who does any skilling that isn't on just portables like that's the most efficient mm. way to do your yeah training. that's a good point um because I will... old school is more likely to have a people prefer the grindy play style which is why they play old school in the first place and that suits the training methods that the guilds are associated with while rs3 players are a little less patience for that I think that's where just, that comes from. That's a very good way of putting it. Um, that being said, I think they, they achieved the hub status of a scale very well with archaeology. Oh, definitely, definitely. And, and yeah, I agree with that. If they could retrofit a hub on all the scales, I think that would be... Well, we got one for farming. Valuable. They kind of did it for farming, and then they split it by having another farm player on farm yeah. on the other side of the continent. Or on a different continent, even. Um, I think, yeah, I think that would be nice. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, Diana, I don't know if we got what your uh, OS update was. Was it just the quest? or? I mean, I don't really know anything about old school. Say it quietly. All right. But, <laughs> um, I, my impression is that the updates they get are slightly more consistent. Like I know players get to vote on their updates, and I know sometimes player voting has real drawbacks in that yeah. what could be good updates gets voted down by a loud minority when it actually could have been very good for the game. Um, but uh, I'm going to be, be a bit salty for a minute. A lot of the RuneScape 3 updates that have happened in the last 18 months or so, I feel like they've just been chucking things at a wall and trying to make something stick. Like and it just hasn't felt like our RuneScape until Archaeology. Archaeology has felt like the most RuneScape three update in a very, very long time, which is why I like it so much. Do well, I old- dare say do I dare say since Dungeoneering? I don't know. I wasn't playing when Dungeoneering came out, so I can't comment. Nope, you're right. I had that same thought. <laughs> <sighs> but things like I like the arc. And things like I, I, Anachronia hasn't been developed enough for me Anachronia to really cross Anachronia is that. there because it's needed for the lore. Yeah, and it's going to hopefully inform quite a bit of the future yeah. lore, so I'm not going to you know, comment on that. But Please it just, don't make me talk about Anachronia. No, no, no. We're not going to talk about Anachronia, don't worry. But, yeah, I wish we had updates that actually felt like part of RuneScape 3 rather than, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this, let's try this. Old school seems to have that mo- slightly better. Um, I mean, I, it, it's kind of it feels kind of like the point, like the thing that we fault old school the most for, which is it's stuck in the past. Oh no! Here we go. Gameplay. <laughs> no, it's not what I'm it, paying on it for. <laughs> uh, Let's not go that way. I know no, where he's like, going, and this is why I don't like it, but continue. <laughs> like, the thing we folded for most, which is it's stuck in the past, is that the exact thing that RuneScape feed is missing that is why... Like, that being stuck in the past means that they get updates that feel like the RuneScape that was around back then. And... You know how awkward well, I, that. I, think I, I don't. I don't mean that I want nostalgia in RuneScape Three. Of course not. No, no, no. Let's be very clear on that. I don't. If I wanted old, the old style, I'd play old school. I don't because I think the old style is worse than what we've got now. You want updates that are new but feel like RuneScape. Yes. Yeah, it, it's basically like just in keeping with the feeling of the game, which is a very, yes. very hard thing to try and put into words. Like you can't really define what a game is. Yeah, or what RuneScape and, is you can't. It's very hard to boil down. And it's down that same open. awkward feeling. RuneFest 2018. I don't know. I don't know where where we were going. We were going to go up and see something, right? And we mm-hmm. get sidetracked by this old school talk. It sounded interesting. <laughs> we sit down for 25 minutes. We don't tell anybody about it for a week and a half. 
then we come back to the podcast after and have a huge discussion about it. And it's that same awkward feeling then as now with this discussion right here. What I hope is that RuneScape 3 is the start of a better period of updates. Hopefully, I know I wasn't particularly a fan of Maud Warden when he first started looking at his kind of gaming pedigree, but I think possibly his direction and his leadership has meant that, or his approach even, has meant a more considered approach to updates. So make things that actually are in keeping with the vibe, as it were, of yeah. RuneScape 3. And, you know... Archaeology has very much, has very, very much done it. Right. And to, to give and I, I want to end this on a positive note. Yeah, that absolutely. Archaeology has absolutely hit the nail on the head. Right. And we give Mud Warden lots of credit here on the show. You guys love him. You we do. You really, really love we him. We do. <laughs> and he was responsible for the hold back and, you know, putting that extra polish on it, which is good. So, but the skill design of archaeology... That was all done before he arrived, and it was a Mod Timbo Mod Roley, project. I th- was it Timbo? Timbo designed think- the initial brief for it. Yeah, Rowley did a lot of the law. Yeah. You know, yeah. Which is good, because he really knows what he's talking and, about. You know, maybe maybe Mod Timbo needs to design more updates. <laughs> it's really funny, because I feel this is exactly sort of in line with what I've been feeling and even saying, is that... What we've seen for the past quite a few years now is that there's something new. Like, I said this when Mott Warden, I, I, I mean, I was skeptical when he joined, but I said this when, like, before, like, as he joined, that what RuneScape is really missing, missing is one direction. I yeah. feel that, you know, every at least once a year they came out with okay, our new future plan for the next five years is going to be, you know, we've got power to the players, we've got expansions, we've got, you know, we've got all these big ideas and big visions, and they disappeared again after like six months because, you know, they didn't stick or didn't work, and that really harmed the game, I think. Yeah, I agree. Even stuff like unfinished business, that's now unfinished business. (laughs) Ha! Yeah, no, that's a really good point, and I think you put it really well. They were just throwing stuff out there and see what stuck and nothing really stuck. And I think that's to be expected because sometimes it takes a while for things to stick. Oh, yeah. What, it can be really hard to try and find a direction. Two different yeah, audiences, somebody, though. Don't you have to take that into to, account? Y- yes. They need to go and sit there in a the meeting room and like slam their fist on the table and be like, this is how we're going to do it for the next year. And... Then we'll re- reevaluate and, and adjust. But I also I think, think there was. Go ahead. Go on. Oh. I think it's a difficulty oh. with something like a live game like RuneScape 3. Yeah. Um, compare that to maybe a one off AAA release where they've had seven, eight years to hammer out the direction, to nail it down, to make the hundreds of changes that you make whenever you're developing a game. Like it goes all over the place. And yeah. the final product is never what the initial concept was. And plus, we also need well, to remember... With, with a live game, you have to come out with weekly releases. You have to come out with the monthly content. Yeah. You have to give something. And there's also a huge shift in the demographic, I feel, of RS3. After EOC, where we lost some people to the old school side, which is fine. And well, then the question became, what does the current demographic of RS3 look like and how do you bring those updates forward with that? See, that's something that I want to, I want to address because I think we can look at old school and, and, and say, yeah, they're, they're more consistent or more this or more that. They're also more cohesive. It's a smaller knit, smaller group, smaller demographics. It's not as diverse as RS3. People are not expecting the same, um, polish it's just it's, yeah it's it's not so when we're trying different things well you kind of have to try different things when you have an audience that is as big right. and diverse but as rs3 right there are design oh, yeah, processes I, in I place that-, that you can use with engagement and research to figure that out but i think True. that's where, we're, where we've gone this year I, and i i'm gonna say it's probably because of mod warden's leadership i think he does have more of a vision and a direction of going like well i I didn't see a lot of fails this year when it comes right but but i I agree with you on that but everything including archaeology 
was on the burner before he started. But we don't know what state right. it was. We right. don't, we don't know. The RuneScape's we... problem has never been that it that it's the the concepts of updates were bad. Like it's they were more they sucked they were more packaged, with like they weren't packaged right. They weren't framed properly. Right. I or follow feeling. through or any of that. Like he he did all of the stuff that they didn't have before. Like their concepts they, they have plenty of concepts, plenty of ideas. <laughs> That we all would love, but I just want to never been their problem. In in the full interest of being a hundred percent honest with everyone here, we don't know what the mod warden era of updates is going to look like content wise. We know what they're going to look like polish wise. We saw that with archaeology, but we don't know what they're going to look like content wise. He's kept we, his cards very we, close to his chest with what comes after do. archaeology. But look at well, we, we kind of do because we talked about what the new cadence was going to be. We have seen what they're doing with the ninja updates, right? So we know that that is going to be every month. There's going to be some ninja strikes. Probably every month. We're going to have some kind of a live update, either currency event or what have you. Cause we've seen that since January. And then every right? two to like, three months, you're going to get a big headliner. Right. So, I mean, we kind of have seen it a little bit, um, or at least the beginning, or what I think is the beginning of a update cadence right. going forward. Uh, this got way off track from that question, so I just want to summarize <laughs> this before we move on. I think these are all valid points. Uh, mine was the Farming Guild. Yours was Dragon Slayer 2. Uh, Diana, really, you, you didn't mention one, and that's okay because you don't know the game. Sirion, did you have one? Uh, like just more game, like game area expansion, okay. continent wise. Yeah, and I'm gonna say something that I wish old school got, that I think they should do at some point. Warding. Hmm. Open that can of worms. Do you dare? <laughs> oh, I'm gonna open it. It's just a question of whether or not we follow through on that, and what happens from it. But I've been watching the drama going. Okay. You guys do that, then. Why are the trolls? Yeah, that, and, and see, that would be one of the fun things about doing an old-school version of the podcast, is we'd get to insert ourselves into that debate. Whether they like it or not. That's right. <laughs> you can have that shame. <laughs> oh, you know, I love the controversial stuff. You should have been around for when we were doing the EOC stuff. I once got... Oh, but that was fun. I once got convinced, or someone told me... Um, that you need to stop modeling yourself after Fox News because that's the way I was treating some people, apparently. Uh, well, well, good advice, but probably, <laughs> but I didn't think uh, I've never seen the show on the same as Fox. Yeah, Shane has some has some Riley tendencies, but that's that's okay. We love him anyway. All right. On that note, if you guys want to send your own questions in, email them to questions at rsbnb.com, post them on Twitter at rsbnb, or leave them at update.rsbnb.com slash ask. All right. Moving into tech news this week, a big, big story, something that we knew and assumed was happening. But G2A, one of the websites that sells game keys, has paid $40,000 to the Factorio devs, which I think it's a sandbox game, isn't it, Sirion? Is that how you describe Factorio, um, like a sandbox builder? I wouldn't call it a sandbox builder. It is. Um, it's not quite a sandbox builder. It's an automation game, right? You just you. Um. Oh, what's the best way to describe it? It's. You know, it's it's it. You can see it as a sandbox game. You start out with some simple stuff. You do a lot of ma- manual like crafting. You automate that, and then it all it's all about scaling up, right? And in the end, you shoot a rocket in space because you want to escape from the planet. And there's a lot of fun in it because all the automation. You know, as soon as you automate something, there's a bottleneck somewhere else. You need to upgrade that, and then there's a bottleneck something else, and then you know, it's sort of it grows in complexity exponentially and that makes it so interesting like that's always the next big challenge um so yeah there all right and why am i getting ads in spanish that is weird or no that's french <laughs> okay that, Shane? yeah well you're in canada so yeah. it's one of the two languages there 
Concevez un appli de exception avec un uh, de service gratuit. I feel like I've just had a stroke. <laughs> yeah. <Have> you call me. <laughs> Um, anyways, uh, in a blog post this week, G2A confirmed that in 2016, 198 copies sold of Factorial on their platform were obtained illegitimately. And because of this, G2A is going to be paying the Factorio developer, Woob, I think that's how you pronounce that, 10 times the bank-initiated refund costs for those fraudulent purchases, which amounts to roughly $40,000. And this has been something that was thought for a long time with G2A. Alleged fraud on this uh, basically allows users to take game keys. You can obtain them from anywhere. Bundles, third-party sources, online uh, retailers, and then you sell them for a price you set yourself. And game developers don't really like this operation. And we're kind of exactly seeing why that's the case here. Um, and it even goes back into 2016 when it got even worse than that. Indie game developer Tiny Build had claimed they lost $450,000 in sales to uh, fraudsters who sold their keys on G2A. And, you know, I've never actually used G2A, and I always advise people that if they're looking for games, you know, just look for one of the look to get them from one of the big stores out there like the steam store or even if it's possible just buy it directly from the dev themselves so g2a is um how do i put this pg you can't they they're they're a cancer in the game selling industry um they V, they, they're a key reseller. So basically, they allow any user to whoever has a leftover game key to sell it there. Except for they do no checking that the key was legitimate. Uh, there are allegations that they actually get these keys. Like, they, they are very hands off and they say, we don't actually own the keys and we are just a reselling platform. Just a marketplace. I, I mean,. They That's how they are. portray themselves, yeah. but the lack of checking means that the fraud is mm. everywhere and game developers yes. lose out a huge amount um, due to this key be- reselling practice. I believe they're even based in – they're registered in China, I think, or something weird, which means that they don't need to fulfill any sort of like laws, like customer protection laws. They're registered out of Hong Kong. Yes. So, you know, they're like, there's a bunch of stuff that they don't need to follow. Customer protection, like getting refunds is a pain. Um, you know, all in all, I think there's there's a tweet in this message from uh, Rami Ismail, um, who I fully agree with. If you can't afford it or don't want to buy for games full price, pirate them. Yeah. The- small indie developers and small developers would rather you pirated their game than bought a key from off G2A. That's how bad it is. That is how bad it is. Yeah, it, it's it's just G2A is profiteering of other people's hard work. That's what's happening Which, here. Um, in our talks know, we, that we've done about indie game dev, you don't want to do that to an indie game developer. Indie game devs live on really, really tight margins. Uh, they, it, It's not something you get rich of. That's, that's for sure. Um, Legitimate shops already take pretty big margins um, by themselves. It's something you sort of have to accept. Um, if you ever can prefer buying stuff directly from the developer, uh, it's probably going to give them the most money. Yep. But, um, you know, going, going on like legitimate stores is sort of a necessary evil that, you know, we can accept. Um, and, you know, if you go on Steam... Steam does do all the distribution for you. Steam is a distribution platform. It has like friends features and like all the online stuff, you know. We can argue whether the percentage they take is too much, but you know that's that's the deal you sign with them. Nobody ever It's the price makes you pay for exposure. Yes. Well, not really Con- anymore. Convenience more than anything. Convenience more than exposure these yeah. days. Because a lot of indie game devs don't do marketing and they don't have the skills or the resources to do the marketing for them and stuff like that. I I wouldn't consider going on Steam being a marketing platform anymore. Like, 
new games are released on Steam every few minutes. You can't mm-hmm. just... It's not an exposure platform anymore, sadly. But yeah, still, you, you, you accept to go on the Steam store. You, get, you accept to go on the Epic store if that's what you're into. Nobody accepts to go on the G2A store. Nobody yeah. wants them to have any money. I made Rush Fusion all those years ago. We are only on Steam, and yet our keys appear on G2A. That's I'm horrible. I'm not even kidding. That's horrible. Um, how, do they, how do they do that if you're just exclusively on Steam? Um, somebody might have gotten a key somehow. I think there's ways to get Steam keys. I think, I think you can get games on Steam. Like they, they randomly give out like a hundred keys every now and then like this. Don't quote me on this. I don't actually know, but you know, there's ways, um, these keys get around. It might also be that these are, um, keys we send out to YouTubers say, right. To try our game um this is part of the problem of g2a is that how do we get how do they get those keys exactly um they're a big problem with stolen credit cards and that ends up costing the developers money because yeah that as well um so yeah please 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 do not use g2a if you care at all about your game designers and you know i'm super glad like factory is a great game they're a great studio I'm glad they got this resolved, but they are, they got pretty big. They got lucky. They got the exposure. They now have a pretty big player base. They can make a fuss about this and game being able to pick this up. For every studio that gets this resolved with G2A, there's hundreds, if not thousands of indie studios losing revenue to G2A. So yeah, ideally nobody would use them and then they would stop existing Sadly, a lot of people are very tempted by um, cheap games. Um, but if you want cheap games, then really just pirate them. At least don't give money to people who don't do anything for it. Cheap games, Steam's on sale every, like, three times a year. You get huge sales, and then every week there's some kind of sale going on. Like, I don't know. Yeah, man. exactly. I mean, there's always sales going on on Steam. All right, uh, let's move on to the next one. This week, Microsoft says, we were wrong about open source, but luckily you can change. And this is in a talk that Microsoft President Brad Smith gave talking about open source privacy and the coronavirus contact tracing apps. And he has said that Microsoft in the past was on the wrong side of history of open source, even going back to 2001 when all the lawsuits were happening then ceo steve ballmer said that linux is a cancer that attaches itself in an intellectual property sense to everything that it touches and even bill gates at the time described the open source gpl license the license that uh most open source apps are licensed under as pac-man like now of course we know microsoft's recent turnabout and over the number of recent years for anybody who's been following them at least on the dev side a little bit less on the consumer facing side microsoft has gone to great strides to embrace open source so much so that they actually own um the github source repository which many developers out there use to store their source code and whatnot and with this we've seen also new advancements into windows to bring more open source style linux features actually into the windows system itself we're going to see another um big one come next year open source package manager for windows and this is microsoft's official admission that yeah we were wrong all those years ago and you know we should have embraced open source sooner than we did and, you know, I, th- I think we're all feeling this uh, to a degree. And who would have ever thought years ago that it would be Microsoft that would be touting the virtues of open source? Pretty rich, isn't it? It, it is. And, you know, they, they kind of need to do it because – and, you know, Sirion, you can correct me if I'm wrong on this. I think most of the time when we're looking at uh, good software – and just in general, making it easy to obtain software and create software. Open source is a huge boon. Um, I've, open source is really funny. Um, in that well, it can't be, because I, I know it, where you're it, going on this. Open source is 
absolutely great. I, 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 I'll be honest, like when I, like maybe like five to 10 years ago, I thought very differently of open source. I was like, hey, it's my work, you know, I want to credit and all that stuff. But, you know, things are just better if you're the, if they're out in public and people cooperate and, and all that stuff. The challenge with a lot of open source projects is that they lack a strong vision and a strong direction. If you look at some of the more famous uh, open source projects, I don't know much about the Linux internals, I'm afraid, but OpenGL is a, is a big example here. OpenGL is basically a set of... It, it, it's one of the drivers that you can use to control your graphics cards. And uh, to turn so really big things deal. on your screen. Exactly. So if you're on Windows, you used to really have two options, DirectX, which is proprietary and owned by Windows. You have OpenGL, which was the open source variant, which was completely developed open source. The thing is, you look at DirectX, it's actually better than OpenGL because it was led by a company who had an interest in making it good because they earned money with it. Well, OpenGL, there's no one person who sets down the vision. So you get all these conflicting ideas and it becomes a bit messy. There's multiple ways of doing things. So pure open source doesn't really work that well unless you have somebody taking charge, which is why I think the current situation where there's Microsoft who clearly leads this stuff but it still accepts all these ideas and contributions from the community. It's probably the best mix you can have. It's what's like Android and Chromium are two examples where Google does this, right? They're open source projects, but Google has a big hand into leading them in a certain direction. And I think this is what um, Microsoft is now doing with um, a lot of stuff, like one of the biggest stuff that I get to work with is um, the C-sharp language as itself has been made open source. The compiler is open source. I, um, and I used to remember when you, for if you want to write code on Windows, you had to spend seven, $800 for Visual Studio. Yeah, that's slowly become, I mean, these, these days Visual Studio is free to use, um, which was an incredibly smart move because you know, it makes more people write code with that. Um, and I think it's gone away from people writing code for Windows specifically to, you know, we just want more people to write stuff. And, um, yeah. Yeah, and this is why this is such an important moment that Microsoft admits this, is that they're becoming, like you said, Google is for Android and Chromium. They're becoming... in themselves in this position for many other products that are pushing windows forward and on the other hand you know you mentioned OpenGL. we have apple who previously you know touted that their operating system had many open source components they're moving away from <laughs> things like OpenGL towards metal which is an apple proprietary system which mm -hmm. you know we still raise questions about and i have questions about but that's a topic for another day on this one and this is you know all in all just good news uh from microsoft on this but i also need to bring like pay attention to the other side because why is microsoft doing this now are they suddenly changing of heart or is there something else going on and one of the comments that i read online which i think is really important to realize is when all these comments were made those years back that linux is bad and all that stuff that was in a time where the main revenue for Microsoft came out of selling Windows. So it wasn't an interest for people to want to use Windows and not Linux. This has changed dramatically where Microsoft is now very focused on their service platforms, yeah. right? Yeah. Azure, the cloud solution Azure is their main source of income. And who and uses Azure? Developers. Bingo. So really what they're doing right now is they're promoting their main product, which is Azure. They're making it easier to use there. Yeah. The and side effects are great, but 
the intentions are probably very rooted in capitalism. Yeah. And on the other hand, you know, you have Apple who's also transitioning to a service based uh system in terms of revenue. They have their own reasons set for it. And that's something we're seeing with all the major uh players in tech in this day and age. And I think we can move on to our last piece of tech news, which is uh Dolby Vision movies are going to be uh appearing in the Google Play movie store. And this isn't something that we have in other stores like the Apple store or the microsoft movie store this is something that is specifically through google play movies um and you know i always enjoyed watching uh the dolby progress as things would progress you know through all these years i remember when there was dolby stereo and then dolby surround now we have dolby atmos and you see here that they are also expanding to the visual side of this with uh Dolby Vision, and what this means for the end users is that when they watch a movie, it'll be have the option of being in HDR 10 plus, which you know, those are just numbers at the end of it. But whenever you have this Dolby label on it, it's for all intents and purposes a certification that what you're going to be getting is going to be. Um, the most supreme in terms of quality. And if you pair it with an appropriate TV or monitor, uh, you're going to get a very good experience on that. And it's interesting that Google is the Google play movies is the first one that's rolling this out. I find on here. How so? Hmm. How so? Well, why is it weird? Because normally they're not the first ones that you would think that would, run with a deal like this. Normally, you'd think that, that would fall to the Apple. Granted, yes, Apple's offering, you know, 4K HDR movies, but at the same time, I don't think I've ever seen a Dolby Vision label on anything on the Apple TV movie store. So it's just interesting that there's this certification from uh, that the movies on Google Play Movies can have that they are Dolby Vision certified that we don't see elsewhere. Um, and, you know, I, I think there's also the question with this, do end users or, or the people who are watching the movies at the end of the day really care about this, that this is out there? I don't know. I found this story interesting. That's why it's in tech news. <laughs> you guys find it interesting? <laughs> I mean, I don't really know I, enough about it to have a comment. I don't even watch 4K, so... <laughs> Yeah, and, and see, that's the point. So many people who have a 4K TV really don't need a 4K TV just because they sit so close to it. But at the end of the day, it's just proving that the technology is there and we can consume on that. Because, you know, most people are watching Netflix on their tablet, right? And do you need 4K? I, I'd love a 4K TV. It's just it, it's not enough of a visual nerd to spend the money right. on it. Sure. And... There are many people out there who are just okay with watching on their tablet as well. But I wonder if – and I think this is more marketing than just anything on this. So, All right. Um, we ready to move on to uh, some achievements after we talk about this uh, skill of the month that's going on? Um, uh, achievements. Okay. okay. Um, I'll just say for skill of the month first now, the attack skill of the month has got five days left to run. Currently, Earth is in first place in this attack skill of the month with 4.5 million XP gained. Second place is Jesse Pinkman with 1.3. And third is Ripith with 114k. And I entered this and I got zero XP in attack <laughs> over the entire week. <laughs> what did Earth do that first day? Did he hack your database? No. I think he was. What did he do? I think he was on a Slayer kick. <laughs> and that oh, was, he got he got ninety nine attack, and that was on double XP as well. Keep in mind. I I, I just check uh, checking his start XP and XP gain. That adds up to the XP needed for ninety nine attack. All right, fair enough. Uh, Thirteen mil. I'm surprised all you quest nerds don't know the best spots to train. We don't for that. That blows my mind. Where is the best it's all, spot? It's dead content everywhere. Well, it's not dead content, but armored zombies, man. Best spot. Best XP rate for any like strength attack. Okay. Like that. I thought that was Ripper Demons with a cannon. Nope. I'm only kidding. Mm, yeah. Mm -mm. <laughs> Second best is uh, Vyres. 
Okay. You have to have a setup, I, I think but, he was doing yeah. Vyers. I think that's what he was. Doing. Yeah, virus is great. You just have to have the right setup, and then all you got to do is just pivot from time to time. I did a million Abbey Demons. Wow. Well, well, I don't know if it was a million, but it felt like a million. Uh, because I also wanted to get Slayer at the same time, and then I thought I'm finally done with Slayer forever. Nope. Then it goes to 120. And uh, now it goes to 120. All right. Let's start off with some achievements. Let's go. Okay. So. Starting off with, we got Gaden with 99 Archaeology on May 20th. We have Lanakia with 99 Divination on May 20th. We have, let's see here, Cleed Dio. Cleed Dio? Sure. Uh, yeah, right? I, I don't know. I'm trying. Um, 99 Agility on May 18th. Uh, I Herblaw with. 120 Archaeology on May 18th. Mythica UK with 99 Agility on May 18th. And Mythica UK with 99 Fishing on the 18th. Mythica UK with 99 Fire Making on the 18th. And Mythica UK with 99 Invention on May 18th. Man, you were busy on the 18th. Uh, then we have Schnitz with 99 Thieving on May 18th. And Stinky Pete 22 with 99 summoning on May 18th. Nicely done. Moving on to B. Adger with 99 Faithing on May 17th. Also on May 17th, we have. What's it with these underscores in the middle of words? D. E. <laughs> underscore Ulta. The Ulta. <laughs> the Ulta, yeah. Uh, 99 Runecrafting on May 17th. Dr. Underscore Bruce, 99 Divination, on May 17th. Do you want me to change it so our system puts spaces instead of underscores? I'm not sure. Um, maybe. Um, Avondale 20 got 99 Farming on May 17th. Guy, Guy Fleur got 99 Fletching on May 17th. Jaguar 007 got a 120 Invention on May 17th. Lord Earth got 99 Dungeoneering on May 17. Apparently he wasn't doing attack all the time. Uh, Questcaping got 99 Cooking on May 17. SW Martin got 99 Woodcutting on May 17. Then moving on May 16, we got Acronia with 99 Fletching. B. Adger with 99 Divination. Bird is the Man with 99 Magic and 99 Defense. I think we got an Armadillo follower here. Mm-hmm. Uh, Clay Dow got 99 farming and 99 woodcutting. Corrupt Pony got 99 magic and 99 attack. Jamie Jenny got 99 farming. Lord Earth got 99 strength. Nordic Falcon got 99 fire making. Seth E. Roth got 99 mining. Nicely um, done. <laughs> On May 15th, for all of these, we have 82nd Airborne with 99 Archaeology, Arcronia with 99 Crafting, Adani with 99 Archaeology, Darth Marth, this tells like a terrible Star Wars villain, um, <laughs> with 120 Invention, Dothal Detra, 99 Smithing, Fra, I, I don't even know, 120 Herblore, Hemsky with 99 Thieving and Crafting, Jag3 Dagster with 99 Firemaking, Magicking with 99 range, defense, magic strength, and attack. SW Martin with 99 invention, and up the iron, 05 with 99 defense. All right, then on the 14th, we have Black Nexican with 120 dungeoneering, Dr. Bruce with 99 fishing, Elysian with 99 thieving, Guy Lafleur with 99 fire making, Hemsky with 99 invention. I Defend with 99 Archaeology and 120 Thieving, Iron Edge with 99 Slayer, Lanakea with 99 Woodcutting, Lord Earth with 99 Attack, Rastafa with 120 Attack, Root Shock with 99 Dungeoneering, Shadow Draxia with 99 Smithing, and some podcaster named Shane12088 with 120 Invention on the 14th, and Tim2 got 120 Construction, rounding out the 14th. God, you can tell it was DXP a week, can't you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we need a, you've all been very busy. We need a breather. 
Finally got that 120, Shane. Good work uh, there, buddy. Yeah, it was, it was yeah, years. Well done. It was well years. Done. It was years in the work. Anyways, uh, pick of the week time. I realize we're running long here, but Sirion has a pick of the week that he insisted we do. Yeah, it's a bit of an old one. Uh, I'm surprised it has never been done before, but um, I want to uh, pick uh, a TV series or a comic series or a cartoon series. I don't know how you call it. Called Avatar The Last Airbender, which is a Nickelodeon series. You might be like, but Sirion, that's a that's a kid show. Why are you recommending a kid show on the podcast as a pick of the week? Now, it Maybe a kid show, but it's also the best show and the best story work arc I've ever seen. It's one of those series that I have watched several times now, end to end, and I just can't find any faults in it. It is a perfect example of a story that touches on some very mature t- themes. Not that kind of mature themes, but like, like it, it, it really touches <laughs> some of the, you know, like the character developments they go to. So the, um, you know, there's, there's a bunch of coming of age stuff in there, but darker themes as well. Um, feelings of responsibility, all, all, all kinds of really, really good stuff. Um, you know, each of the characters in there is super deep, super important uh to the story and you know it it it's just really really good um i could go on forever about you know i could take a single episode and could go on forever for it yeah uh, about it probably, i'm just i'm just reading I won't do. about some of the themes in it and um have you not seen it shane no i haven't and what <gasps> issues related to war to. genocide imperialism totalitarianism gender discrimination female empowerment marginalization and oppression and of it's course really destiny good. and free choice from what jumping on with Sirius said it's one of the single best tv shows i have ever seen ever oh. it's oh. so good <laughs> like i watched it with quest caping um a while back we did a whole series watch from start to finish and he'd never seen it before either um and it's just absolutely incredible. If you haven't seen it, I would definitely recommend watching it. Um, the, it's the, not it's... even that long, I think. It is three seasons of about 20 episodes, I think, of like 20 minutes each. So you can yeah. get through it pretty quickly. Um, yeah, it's, it's not very drawn out. Um, but the storytelling is one of the best things I've ever seen in a kid's TV show. The storytelling is great. The world building is super on point and consistent. Um, you know, they did a lot of these, like, uh, yeah, they did a lot of research in martial arts and, you know, making sure that that all represents really well. Um, yeah, it's pretty amazing. And it's even funny as well. Like, you have all these dark It is themes, funny. It is very funny. But there, it, 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 it is very interspersed with a lot of, like, humor and lightheartedness. And um, it it works really well uh, that balance. Um, it it yeah it, it's it's super solid. Um, the reason I'm bringing it up now as pick of the week is that I think since last week or so it has become available on Netflix in the United States. It has been available in other countries like the UK for a while now. Um, but yeah, this is probably a really good time to just get going and get started on it. Um, on top of that, um, don't watch the movie. They did a real-life action movie for it. It is one and a half hours of torture. It is, is that worth... Cage? No. Okay. Um, I thought he was an airbender. It is absolutely terrible. It, it just doesn't do justice. Um, that being said, Netflix has recruited the original creators of this series to make a complete real life like live action remake of the series which has been in the works already for two years and they haven't even started filming yet uh they're throwing a lot of budget at it and basically what we're going to see is we're going to see the same story but basically drawn out going into the themes even deeper and even better so i'm really excited for that um as well but yeah give it a watch uh you won't regret it um it is one it's of the best shows. 
if not the best shows out there. And I, 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 I say that with confidence. All it's a right. show that managed to do what Game of Thrones failed to do in that it has one of the best examples of a high stakes, satisfying ending. Oh, good. Yes. Yeah. So if you're still cross about Game of Thrones, fucking it up, watch Avatar. <laughs> <laughs> right on. I am. All right. Uh, Tannis, what have you been up to at RS this week? Uh, man, I had to go and gather energy, but um, yeah, I'm doing, I'm actually doing that on mobile too so but it it works really well so it's like oh uh, this is cool so yeah actually gathering energy because i'm i'm running out of uh borders and chargebacks and all the other essentials yeah every everything yeah yeah it's better to gather it yourself than pay for it so and uh i i don't know uh we need that we need to get that relic what level archaeology are you 82. Okay, so it's going to be a while yet for you and me. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, Sirion, what have you been up to? Digging. Still, eh? I, yes. Uh, it is, you know, when I log in and I think about what do I want to do, I'm like, I want to go digging, which, yeah, ask, ask Sirion a year ago, he would have laughed in your face but um no that's what i'm doing i um i recently unlocked the second area in warforge um which i like less than the first area uh i'll be honest oh really but um yeah i thought the reverse for me um but there's a lot of good stuff there i I did a bunch of mysteries i really enjoyed that now i'm back to you know collection completion um i think there should be a collectionist cape instead of like yeah i don't know (laughs) Um, uh, anyway yeah that's what i've been doing um i keep it's really funny i keep going into the game and be like okay i should you know check out my farm and my ranch every day like i do but i want to go dig instead so i don't like all my other stuff has been neglected pushed to the burner back burner yeah exactly it's it's not been i've not been as engaged with runescape anymore like as I was on release, I've started playing other games again, but you know, it's still, I'm still playing more than before archaeology yeah. for sure. Yeah, that's good. All right, uh, Diana? Literally just archaeology. I have been doing archaeology for what weeks, level are you and I'm going to be doing it for. I am literally just about to hit 94. Okay. As in, um, about 30 seconds away from hitting 94. Nice. Nice. Um, so I'm getting there. I'm really, really impatient to get to 107 because that's when a lot of the really good law stuff just kicks mm. off mm-hmm. um but i feel like between work and everything else i've got going on at the moment it might be a little while coming but yeah um archaeology i'll be writing up the law document for everlight next is that the one we're doing no. next that's the one we're doing next all right so I get your sword on this hats on it's going to be fun uh as for me Lots of archaeology still just hit 90 and Professor uh, yesterday. And, you know, I actually hit the number of restorations needed for Professor at the same time as I got 90. So that one really Very worked. Nice. As associate, nice. I was about – I was a ways off still for that one. So I was wondering how that would turn out. But it turned out really well um, for the Professor rank. And now I'm deciding what do I do for the rest of the 90 to 91 journey. And I think I'm just going to – uh, maybe farm the ba- one of the Bandos collections for Tetra Compass pieces because I don't know that I want to stay at that Bandos dig site, the level eighty nine Bandos dig site, all the way to rest uh, ninety one. If I could be farming Tetra Compasses instead, and you know, once again, and we talked about it today, Infernal Source is good for lore, but I just it's just something I don't prefer working the Infernal Source dig sites. For some reason, I don't. So. Uh, much rather prefer the Warforge at level 89. Uh, but beyond that, uh, not much else to report. RS Mobile is uh, still running pretty good. Found a little uh, thing that was mentioned in the RS Discord. I think it was by Asher's. Is if you have mobile and you want to open the dev console to see how your device is doing uh, for frame rate, you can swipe down from the top of your screen with four fingers and it will bring down the dev console for that. So you can get an FPS meter up, see how your cache is and all that other stuff that you would be doing normally. 
on the desktop. But I think that's it for this episode of RSBNB Update. So we'll leave it at that. Thank you for that wonderful lore perspective, Diana, on Infernal Source. That was good. I look forward to Everlight. And as we mentioned, if there's any thoughts you guys have about how we did that, you have suggestions about how we might do the next one differently, just send them along to any of us and we'll be sure to work that in. You can send them to me in game, Shane12088, or send them in to us on Twitter at RSBNB or Diana, Diana, which is Diana underscore RS. Yeah, I've left my Twitter, Twitter handle on the law document, so come and yell at me yeah, if you and feel I'll, like and I'll it. put that in the show notes too at update.rsbnb.com. And just before we go, I'll remind our listeners that if you want to get the podcast and you're just listening to us on uh, the off chance on YouTube, but if you want the audio versions too, you can subscribe to them on any number of podcast listeners out there, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, Spotify, Pocket Cast, anything under the sun. Just head on over to update.rsbnb.com slash subscribe. And of course, subscribing is good for the ranking of the podcast. So if you listen weekly, but you're not subscribed, subscribe. Now and then you won't forget to download when the new one arrives. So with that being said, we'll see you guys all next week for another episode of RSBNB Update.